Hey everybody, welcome here. Welcome back. Uh, just getting things started for the live stream uh, lecture tonight. Got one more lecture meeting and then two more class meetings. Next week will be a review session and then uh, two weeks from today is obviously the final. So we're getting close to the end of the semester, but anyway, um, welcome everybody who's here. Feel free to say hi or give a comment of any kind at any time. And uh, once six o'clock hits, just you know, five, six minutes away, then I'll be right with you guys and we'll go over the notes that we have for today. Um, so hopefully you all had a really good week, staying healthy, staying safe, and um, ready to just go into one last interesting philosophical discussion of some of the texts that we've been reading. I'll be right back. I'm just going to grab myself a little beverage and uh, be right back. Stay hydrated. Hi, Cameron. How are you? Good to see you there. Hope you had a good week, too. <clears throat> I've been doing fine. Just holding it down at home, teaching a lot, <clears throat> staying uh, you know, active, trying to get in a little uh, daily exercise and jog and things like that. Trader Joe's stuff? Yeah, I've had that. Um, I'm happy to drink any kind of sparkling water. I've definitely sampled a lot of different options. Uh, you know, that's the claw. Yeah, I'm a fan. I used to drink a lot of soda as a kid, so that kind of provides that carbonation, but I don't want to be drinking like five and six different sodas every day, you know? We got an exercise bike. That's good. Yeah, it gives you a way to do it at home, right? I would like to have a treadmill. Um, someday that'll have to happen for sure. There actually used to be one right here um, on site at the recreational facility here in the place where I live, but uh, they shut it down because they don't want to have common areas clearly during the pandemic. So my go-to treadmill workout, I have to just now run through the streets, but that's what I would normally do anyway. Just sometimes when it's bad weather, it would be nice to have the indoor option. Things will slowly open up over time. I'm in no rush, uh, but yeah. Good to see you guys. Hey, hey, Michael, good to see you too. <clears throat> cool. Glad that we got a few people already here. Just gonna get my notes set up. <clears throat> cool. Yes, 40% capacity in the six-foot rule. Um, yeah, it's, you know, 
going to be a process, right? I think a lot of people are going to be definitely uh, cautious about going to big public places for a while, even in, you know, even when they open and they provide a little bit of service. A lot of people are going to be still a little hesitant because uh, the the curve has not exactly uh, stopped. I mean, it's a plateau. I don't know if it's continuing to go up, but still a lot of people dying every day in the country. So, you know, California is a pretty progressive state. We're probably going to be one of the ones to take the most cautious approach, I would hope or I would think. But yeah, um, businesses are going to get it going. The movie theaters and restaurants and stuff, you know, hair salons, it's all, it's all going to take its time. But yeah, we'll have a slow and steady approach and we'll get back to normal. I think it's a good chance by fall that there will be face-to-face -face classes again at Orange Coast. We'll see. Uh, that's kind of currently being debated in the uh, ranks of the faculty and the administration. Um, but obviously they're going to follow the guidance provided by the state. Nonetheless, we're being told to prepare for the possibility of an online semester. We just don't, yeah, they want us to certify ourselves for like a little couple week course. Anyway, <clears throat> that's just fun administrative stuff work right now, but I don't think it would be a smart move. I feel bad for service industry workers or frontline. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, uh, essential workers, it's like they're really risking their lives or they, you know, they ha kind of have to do this to maintain their um, livelihood. It's a sad choice where people are kind of having to think about, well, do I want to take a risk with my life or do I want to make sure that I maintain my employment? Um, but yeah, daily runs, saving your grace for sure. Yeah, same with me. I'm a big time uh, believer that you gotta have at least a little bit of physical activity in there, and I'm a I'm a daily runner myself, um, except for Thursdays, this day because I have to teach you guys from six to nine. But every other day of the week, I'm out there doing something. Um, all right, guys. Well, it's pretty much six, so welcome back. Good to see everybody here. We got a tight crew right now, just a few of us, but hopefully a few will show up as we go through the you know couple hours of our meeting. Um, let me ask a question to anybody here. Hey, Sherry, good to see you too. Did anybody um, notice my message or Canvas notification today? I, I sent you guys um, basically the study guide for the final. Can anybody just make sure or, I mean, confirm for me that that did get through? If you got it, uh, I'd love to know, and then I know I don't have to resend it. Okay, good, yes. So that's the uh, study guide list um, to take a look at for the uh, upcoming final exam and then next week we're gonna go over the uh, the, the list too yeah good okay um, no no rush on looking at it but you're gonna see a big list of questions which is divided between all the different um, essays that we've read in the class so basically uh, that's the set of questions like with the midterm you know I gave you the study guide and I said I'm gonna ask you a certain number of questions off of this list that's how the final is going to be too. I'm going to take a set number of questions off of the big master list, and then I'm going to ask you to answer a certain number of them. So I think with the midterm, you had to give me a seven answers or so. Um, I, if I remember correctly, I think it was like seven out of 11. So for the final, it'll be very similar to that. It might be like answer eight questions out of you know 10 or 11 or something. Um, so I'm going to select the questions off the list. Since you have the list, um, there should be no surprise. You know, you can go through each question, try and think about how you would supply an answer. You can write out sample answers. You should attend the review session. Um, if you had any other questions that you don't get to cover in the review session, then you can always email me. But next week in the review session, when we have another three hours, uh, I think we'll be able to go over all the questions that are on the second half of the list. So. Um, you know, you can think about your answers at any time. You should probably go to your notes in the book and try and like just take a quick look at some of them and see how you might respond and then also attend the review session next week and you should be in fine shape for the final. Um, don't forget also that next week your second paper is due so uh, you've had a little while on that but one more week and then it's due next Thursday the 14th so keep it in mind you have to submit it to me just by email um, anytime before class time uh, next Thursday the 14th. So we're down to those I, mean, I feel like it's pretty straightforward and clear, but you'll let me know, right? At any time, if, if there is something that you'd like to ask or something that I maybe forgot to mention or could have been clear about, you just uh, type in a little question in this live chat, and then I'll see it. Okay, guys. So uh, let's go on, and then we have a little bit more business to cover on this uh, 
last day of lecture. So um, <clears throat> we've been dealing with the philosophy of mind subject for the past couple weeks. That's all about uh, questions concerning consciousness and uh, perception and experience. You know, what is the nature of consciousness? Is it, is it uh, merely the brain which produces consciousness so it's entirely physical? Or is there something about consciousness and perception that is not um, physical? Is it somehow like more spiritual, like a soul or the non-physical, disembodied, non-extended mind? Those are different views about how many substances make up everything in the universe. Monism claims that there's only one substance that makes everything. Dualism claims that there's two. And um, the substances that are being mentioned in these uh, uh, theories or uh, accounts are either physical matter or the mind. So physical matter is, uh, if you remember, just anything that's extended in space, that takes up space, that occupies some amount of space. Uh, and the ultimate constituent of matter is gen generally referred to as the atom. So, uh, and, you know, theologians even consider the mind to be a disembodied, um, a non-extended, something that lacks extension, has no extension in space, and nonetheless is conscious and has the and is thinking. So, okay, um, question, how many substances are there? So if you're a monist, you think there's just one. And therefore, since there's two possible substances, there are two types of monism. There's, on the one hand, physicalism, which says that everything is 100% all made out of matter, including consciousness and thought and everything having to do with uh, mind. So physicalism says everything's made out of atoms, including the brain, which is really the real basis of consciousness. And then dualism, uh, sorry, another type of monism is idealism, which says that everything is made out of ideas. So there's actually no matter, there's just thoughts. According to physicalism, there's only matter. According to idealism, there's only ideas. Um, now we really are mostly focusing on the debate between the physicalist uh, perspective and dualism. So on the other hand, dualism just says there's both. It says there's matter and there's mind. So matter is just anything extended in space. The mind is that non-extended thinking thing. And to a dualist, uh, a thing like me or you is an individual which is basically essentially the mind that's thinking inside that, that has thought and doesn't really require the existence of the body. But then we have this bodily form attached to us and physical objects all throughout space around us are made out of matter. So dualists think that matter is pretty much most stuff, but then minds which are thinking and feeling and having ideas and stuff, those are more like souls or ghosts or something that somehow um, relate to this body, but they're not met, not even a part of it. They're just, they're not extended in space like the body is. Okay, so um, arguments were given for the various perspectives. Um, we studied the argument by Descartes for dualism. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a lengthy and nuanced argument. Um, I don't want to, you know, go into too much review, but uh, what I would say is that overall the argument says with a method of doubt, you could doubt almost anything because um, who knows if you're dreaming or if there's some deceiver that's out there that's manipulating your everyday perception. But one thing you cannot doubt is that you exist just because you're thinking. And since you know you exist and you're thinking, um, you've got ideas in your mind. And one of them is the idea of God, which he says is an idea of something infinite, so that has to come from some infinite source, therefore there really has, must be a God to, to cause that idea. Okay, and then if God exists, which he says that's proven, he's perfectly good, and if he's perfectly good, he wouldn't deceive you about the things that are the most clear and obvious. So clear and distinct perceptions have got to be true due to the perfect goodness of God, that he's not a deceiver. And one of the clear and distinct perceptions is that if you can imagine two things existing separately from each other, and that's clearly conceivable, then they could actually exist separately from each other. An easy example of that would be like me and these glasses. You can see it's on my head, but it's no problem at all to just take them off, and then you know, me and the glasses are separated. Um, and what Descartes says is any two things that you can imagine separating out could really be separated. So the last point in his argument is that we can't imagine or understand the ability for the mind to exist without the body. And since that is clearly conceivable, they must really be two separate things. So that's dualism. The mind and the body are different. And after that, he did add a few other little points. He said that it seems clear and distinct that, um, that the external world exists. He gave a number of reasons for that. Um, and then he also says clear and distinct.
just think that you have a body and you give reasons for that. The world existing, that seems clear because you can't just dream up whatever you want to perceive as you would think you could if it was just not real. And um, the perceptions that you have are not just of the things that you desire, so that's also showing that the world is real. Plus, memories aren't as clear as the original perceptions. Um, and there's also the point he makes about how everyday life seems like it's the real world because it's continuous, but dreams are episodic. You know, a dream, it's not like a Netflix series where it's like, I'll, t I'll get the next episode tonight when I sleep again. They don't go like that. They're just broken up into episodes so um, that are disconnected. I think that the world exists. Also that you have a body because, um, you know, like you can control your body, but you can't control other people's bodies. And, you know, like you can make your own body move just by thinking. Or that you can feel the sensations which occur when this body is uh, given stimuli, but not when other bodies are affected by some stimulus. And then that you can't remove yourself from the body you're in, but every other body you could get away from it. Okay, so that's the dualist stuff from Descartes. And then after that, we started looking at the uh, physicalist arguments. So there were there were kind of three authors that we talked about on physicalism, and one of them we got to wrap up today at the beginning here. So there was uh, Daniel Stoljar. He talked about supervenience. So he says that physicalism claims everything's physical. Question, what does that mean? He says, okay, answer. What it means is everything supervenes on atoms. So you got to understand supervenience to be able to interpret physicalism. Supervenience is a concept that is explained when you think of examples of like a big structure that's made out of a bunch of tiny little elements, like a dot matrix, which is a big picture, which is ultimately composed out of a bunch of tiny little dots of ink put in a certain order and a certain arrangement. Um, in a structure called global features are nothing other than the pattern of the dots. So if you had two identical dot matrices with the same exact ordering of parts, then they would have all the same global features. Okay, so then the physical universe is thought of as something like that because the universe we are a part of is a big structure, but it's built out of little parts. And the little parts, in this case, are just atoms. So what is claimed is that everything's made out of atoms, even consciousness and thought. So much so that if, for example, there was another universe which was atomically a duplicate of ours, so arrangement of atoms in that universe is just like ours, then that second universe would have to have all the same features that ours does. So we'd have a copy of each person and all their conscious processes and thoughts. So that means that the thoughts that you do have are nothing other than the byproduct of all the atoms agglomerated together the way that they are. Okay, and then there was JJC, well, a little more on Stoljar before I move on too quickly. He also gave arguments that it's true, that physicalism is true. So he gave the argument from causal closure and then also the argument from methodological naturalism. So you could go back and review what those arguments were if you like. Basically, the causal closure argument says that there's only one cause for each effect. And your brain is causing your behavior, and that's it. There's nothing else. It's just the brain. The other argument is the argument from methodological naturalism, which says uh, it's just reasonable to believe whatever science does. And they basically believe physicalism, so that's reasonable to believe. Now, after that, there was J.J.C. Smart. His article was called Sensations and Brain Processes. And he overall was arguing that when you have sensations, which are conscious states, any kind whatsoever, tastes, smells, sights, um, you know, sounds, whatever, any kind, of music, uh, any kind of experience that you could possibly have whatsoever is a sensation. And so his claim is that sensations are just states of the brain. They're just the brain process happening at that time. So like for you to be watching this lecture and having this experience, that's just a sensation, which is really just a brain process. Um, and that's why he's a physicalist, because he says even your consciousness is just the brain, and that's just physical. If it wasn't, it would be a nomological dangler, which is something that science can't explain or hasn't explained. And he says we should not think that consciousness is, is something like that. It's not unexplainable physically. So he takes on what he thinks are the best objections to physicalism that dualists would make. And... Um, the number one objection, I guess, that we highlighted was some people would argue consciousness, sensation, that cannot be the same as a brain process because when you speak about your experiences, you do so easily. But you don't have any ability to talk about what is happening in your brain. So a person may think those are not the same thing. But, uh, you know, he says that's not a good point because just because there are two names for something doesn't mean that there have to be two different things that the names are referring to. You can have basically two words for one thing. So the morning and the evening star are like that. Those are 
a pair of words that people thought referred to two different stars, but actually it's the same object up there that the two words both refer to. So uh, sensations and brain processes are kind of like morning and evening star. You can think they're different, they may sound different, they may get described differently, but they're actually the same thing being referred to in other words. Okay, um, then there was Turing, okay? And so Turing is, I think, where we kind of left at the end last time. So I just kind of want to go over the last remaining information in the Alan Turing article. Um, so let me know if this sounds familiar to you. Alan Turing, who lived from 1912 to 54. In 1950, he wrote this article, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. In this paper that he wrote, so he's first, he, I told you guys, he's the creator of the digital computer, um, so revolutionary uh, device, clearly, and technology. And um, he makes the argument in this essay that someday computers and machines, they're going to be thinking, they're going to have consciousness like we have. He thinks that's possible. It's an interesting question. Could a machine ever have th a consciousness? Could a machine ever actually think about stuff? Um, and he says, yes, they would be able to do that someday. Now, in his mind, the way to evaluate whether machines have consciousness or not would be to put them to a certain test, which he calls the imitation game, or which has subsequently come to be known as the, the Turing test. Okay, so I'm going to draw up the little diagram of that imitation game one more time. Can any of you guys tell me if you remember some basic facts about that? What is, how does the imitation game go? Does anyone remember? And then I can just take your input as a starting point for this. Um, how does the imitation game work? Just very anything uh, that you remember about it. <clears throat> What's the process of getting this game going? So how does it go? What do you know? Imitation game? Just let me know. Basic stuff. Okay, Sherry. So a human tries to guess who the computer and human are on the other side of a wall through written format. Okay, pretty good. Perfectly, yeah. Um, so this is a little visual that you should have in your mind. On this side of the so imitation game. Over here, you got a person who's the interrogator. Over here on this side of the wall, you have one human being and then one computer. Here we get to ask questions to um, the other two individuals, the one computer, the one human. And he would interview each one separately for like a five minute period of time. And then after he conducted all the interview, his goal is to try and judge which one was actually human and which one was the machine. He knows that there's one of each, but he is not told in advance which one it is. So all he knows is like first I'm talking to A and then after that I'm talking to B and then it's left to him to judge was B a human or a computer or was A, right? Now the thought that Turing had was that if we get to a point where this interrogator really just cannot tell the difference between the two and so that they mistake the identity uh, about half of the time that's when we should say that these are thinking machines, that the computers actually have consciousness. Because at that point, they have got behavior which cannot be distinguished um, from the behavior of actual human subjects. So that's his test. He says this is what you would have to uh, surpass as a computer in order to be established as having got consciousness. Um, he thought that by the time of the year 2000, which was 50 years after he wrote this paper, that we would have artificial intelligence which was smart enough to fool a person maybe about 25% of the time. But he said, you know, eventually as computers inevitably get more powerful, have better processing uh, power, better data storage and speed, that they would inevitably consciousness if and when 
they meet this standard that he um, considers to be the right one in this game. Um, so I just want to talk to you guys also about the objections to this. I think that that's the things that we didn't really cover last week. I told you what the game was, that it was a game which was supposed to be able to test whether computers had consciousness or not. But if you're sitting back hearing this or reading about it and thinking, but I don't know though, is that really going to be consciousness just if it does that in the game? I mean, what's really the nature of consciousness? Is that something that is shown by means of this game? If you had an assumption that you could generate consciousness in a machine and that would be exhibited by means of this test. Um, okay, so uh, next thing he says though, just as we kind of go through the whole um, argument, he says, what machines are used in this game? What machines play the role of B? Um, he says, these machines can be digital computers, but they should not be human brains. Now, when I read that, it's a funny thing that he says, because you'd imagine, of course, it's not going to be a human being that's playing the role of B. The whole point is to see which one is a human and which one's a computer. But that is like, I think, an insight into the way that Turing thinks. In his view, in his thinking, the human brain just is a computer, but it's a biological, organically created computer. You know, it's a computer generated by nature and by evolution. Um, but it's not itself conceptually different from the digital key. It can be any kind of computer as long as it's not a human brain born through sexual reproduction. So the individual that's in the place of B just can't be a human pretty much. It's got to be an artificially created computer, not one that was created through live birth. Okay. Um, so what is this concept of a digital computer? The next thing that Turing does is he just tries to explain to the... So he talks about the digital computer compared to the human computer. Once again, reinforcing this point that he thinks of the human brain as just a very sophisticated, naturally occurring kind of computer yeah. in nature. So <clears throat> let's compare then the digital versus the human computer. Okay, so he's starting with the uh, with the human computer there. The human computer, you know, you're you've got one. <laughs> It's working right now, um, working hard, trying to understand concepts um, and process information at a high level. So we have one installed right here um, on top of the neck area. And there are three main features of the human computer according to Turing's kind of analysis. So three major features of the human computer are these three. Number one, that the human computer follows fixed rules. Okay, so um, an interesting thing to consider about, you know, being a living being like you are and having a mind and having a brain, it's not like our thoughts and our behavior is just random and haphazard, you know. Um, everything that we do is something that operates according to a specific rule or pattern. Like for me to talk to you, I can't just start like making random noises with no semantic content, blah, 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 blah. You know, like, that doesn't mean anything. I have to use the vocabulary and grammar established by the rules of the English language to communicate information to you. Um, for me to even walk, you know, you can't just do any old thing. There's a specific type of procedure which you must undertake in order to get the limbs to support the body as you move. Um, when you ride a bike, you know, you're doing so according to certain established uh, procedures which will keep you in balance and keep the bike propelled forward. Um, when you write down words, like we are writing words from this board or typing them, you do so in accordance again with the playing a musical instrument. Um, everything that you do is something that can be governed by a specific kind of rule-based description. Unless what you do starts to become insane and you're like losing your mind, that's when people do things that no one can possibly interpret as following any kind of logical rule. So even though we're not often consciously thinking about it, it's not like when you're walking, you're like, 
left foot, right foot, plant the foot, make sure to plant the heel, then put the toe. You don't think of all those things consciously, but it is happening. And therefore, uh, the human brain, the human computer, as he would call it, does in fact follow uh, rigorous structured rules in every last detail of your life. Um, the only exception being that you have gone uh, like and lost your mind or something, and now you're behaving in a way that is uh, insane and irrational. But that, thankfully, is a rare case. Okay, so the human brain follows fixed rules unless it's malfunctioning for some kind of cognitive reason. Second thing about the human computer is that these rules, as he would put it, and this is a little bit of a metaphor, but he says the rules are supplied in a book, quote unquote. I'll say it this way, the rules are contained in a book, and I'm putting the word book in quotes because it's obviously not literal. Now, um, all he's stored there, uh, try and remember a friend's name right now, or try and remember information that you learned in this class a couple weeks back, or one of your passwords um, for you know one of your social media accounts, or try to remember um, a phone number of a person that you have memorized. You know, memory is the retrieval of information which is stored in your mind. And um, when he wrote this paper, it was 1950. So in the year of 1950, people didn't have hard drives and all that yet, right? Computing technology was in its baby steps. Um, so if you wanted to try and give a sense of a metaphor to a person about how the brain can contain a lot of information which is stored there, and you were writing in 1950, what kind of metaphor do you think you might utilize to give the reader a sense of that? Well, you would probably talk about a book because that's, of course, how information was stored for human beings for the whole of human history, the entire period of human history until this modern computing era. So, you know, he's saying to his readers, the brain has this limitless, all, I mean, it's not actually limitless, there are some limits, but it's got a vast um, domain of information which it can contain. And so that's like the book that contains all the information and so called rules that the, the brain will utilize as it as it executes um, the functions of everyday life. Okay, so we've got two things so far. There's rules in this brain or human computer and there's a very vast repository of information which it stores. We could call that a book. The third thing is that, again about the so-called book, that the uh, the book, as it is called, has infinite paper. Okay. And that's also, you know, metaphorical, but the point that he's making with this claim is the human brain, it seems to have no like limitations on the amount of information that it can accumulate. Uh, the only limitation would be the natural limits of your lifespan. But aside from that, or, or another case, um, brain injury or cognitive disability, cognitive decline. But aside from that, there's really no uh, upper boundary to how much new stuff that you can, uh, can, can learn or can take in in the mind. So we're a little different from digital computers in that way because a digital computer has like, you know, a certain set storage capacity. And once you reach that, you have to start deleting files. Uh, to put things in there. Uh, but that's not how the human brain works, right? It's not like for you to learn uh, Spanish or something, you're going to have to delete all your knowledge of history, you know? So for you to learn this lecture on Turing, maybe you got to delete some files from earlier in the semester having to do with Edmund Gettier. But that's not how it works, right? We just can sort of pile on new stuff um, and learn more and more. Um, so you can always learn a new thing, and the, bra the brain seems to have no finite boundary um, at least in terms of its potential to learn more. Now, the digital computer has some similarities to the human computer, at least roughly. And he mentions three big parts of the digital computer. So number one, there's what he calls the store of information. In modern terms, that's kind of like the, uh, the hard drive of the computer that has all of the programs um, and software downloaded onto it. So a computer has a store of information, just like the brain has this 
as he would call it, book to collect, to, to store information and rules. Also, there's the executive unit of the computer. Sometimes we call that the central processing unit or the CPU of the computer. That's the thing which retrieves information from the store of information and executes functions based on that. And then the third part of the digital computer is the control unit, which just makes sure that the uh, information contained in the store is interpreted in a logical order instead of some kind of like random or disorganized way. So digital computers that have been structured along these basic principles do less things uh, ourselves. The computer can take over intellectual labor that used to have to be done by us. So when you do a Google search, I mean, imagine that. You just want to like, I don't know, like alligators. You type it in. Now you're learning about them. If you had wanted to know about that 100 years ago, you would have had to, you know, go out, find a book somewhere in the world, sit down, read it, um, and take that information in. Nowadays, the, the computer makes much easier for you the tasks of everyday life because some of the things that you would have had to do, it can do for you. Um, if you wanted to have a very sophisticated, like, graphic design of architecture. Nowadays, you might be able to use a computer program to help you construct that digitally, and a lot of people do. Um, it used to have been, of course, that you would have had to draw these things yourself as a skilled um, blueprint. So the computers take things uh, that we used to have to do, and they do them for us, which, makes, which frees up our mind for other intellectual tasks and for other pursuits. Um, so they can mimic the operations of the human computer quite closely. Next thing, he talks about how the digital computer is a discrete state machine. And I just want to briefly talk about the term discrete state machine. <clears throat> OK, so the term discrete state machine, it has a particular meaning. It's a, a system or a machine that is in one definite state at a given time. So it's in exactly one state at each time. And each new state that it is in is a function of two things, the prior state plus an input signal. OK, so it is a system um, that is in one definite state at a time. Uh, with each new state being determined by being a function of the previous state plus an input signal. Okay, so discrete state machine, it's in one state at a time, and each new state is based on these two things, the prior state and the input signal. So let me try to um, explain this with a current example that I've got right here in front of me. Now, <clears throat> right here, you see my uh, cell phone. So I'm turning it off, and it's on. Off. It's powered off right now. So that's the state that it is in right now, powered off. Now, if I apply pressure to the power button, you see the lock screen, OK? Now, if I swipe, we're at the home screen. Let's just focus on this situation that it's in right now. It's on the home screen of the cell phone. This is a computer, by the way. That's why I'm using it. Uh, our cell phones, our smartphones are like pocket computers that we all carry with us every day. So the current state of this discrete state machine is that it's displaying the home screen. Can you tell me? Uh, what the two factors are that led it to be in this state, the prior state plus an input signal. So what was the prior state before the home screen? It's on the home screen now. What, what was the uh, state that it was in before it was on the home screen? Let me know what you think.
It's on the home screen at this time. OK. Phone was locked, and before that, turned off. OK, so let's just focus on the last step right before. It was on the lock screen, correct? What was the input signal that I gave when it was on the lock screen that changed it to the home screen? What about that? I had to apply a stimuli to it. I gave it an input. And with that input, plus the fact that it was on the lock screen, I opened up the home screen. It's a simple question, though. What was my uh, input? The swiping. Right, exactly. And that's just one example. But that is how every new state in the discrete state machine is generated. Suppose, for example, that I want to uh, open the browser, right? So while it's currently, there's Kitty. While it's currently in the home screen, if I touch the browser, uh, app first state was home screen, and input signal was apply uh, touch to the browser button. That's just how computers work in every single case. Um, regardless of the almost limitless variety of states that they can actually display, they operate according to those principles. So uh, if you type in to Google Turing, Alan Turing, and then you hit the return key. Don't worry about the typo. Yeah, so you follow me. You, you're on Google. You type in Alan Turing. You hit return. Now you see all these dis displayed results You know, uh, for the name Alan Turing. Now you're looking at that state of your computer system. Well, once again, what was the prior state? Having the search bar filled with the name Turing. And what was the input signal? Pressing the return key. And if you click on one of the links, now you're looking at a page. And that's because the prior state was results displayed on Google and an input signal of clicking that link was given. Um, if you play a video game, perhaps, and you just, let's say, I don't know, um, beat the boss, and you see congratulations for passing the level displayed on the screen. That is because the prior state of the system just before that was battling the boss, and the input signal was whatever you did with the controller or the keyboard that functioned to cause it to unlock this next point in the game. OK, so discrete state machines, then, um, are sometimes called universal machines, because if you have another computing system which can display at least as many discrete state machines, uh, sorry, discrete states as the first, if you have a second computing system which can display at least as many discrete states as the first one, then you can port over any software or program from the first onto the second. That's why we can all play like the same kind of uh, video games and such on different platforms, because all that has to happen is that that computing system can process as many discrete states as are included in the game which, of course, are vast and numerous. Um, if a digital computer was mimicking another digital computer in the imitation game, they could mimic each other perfectly well, because they could just sort of have at, at least as many discrete states as the other system does have. So now, OK, having a little bit of further insight into the logical analysis of computing systems, Turing says the real question we have is, could a discrete state machine, which is basically more fancy um, developed understanding of what a computer is. Could a discrete state machine ever do well enough in the imitation game to cause the interrogator to reliably get the wrong uh, identification? And again, he thinks, yes, that will happen someday um, in the full future. Now, of course, when he writes in 1950, he's nowhere near that day because there's no real artificial intelligence computing systems which existed at his time. But he knew that it was only a matter of time before processing power storage capacity and data speed would enhance the ability of computers to do well in such games. So he thought, we'll get there. And today we're a little closer, of course, uh, than ever before. If you look at the sophistication of current day um, chatbots and, um, and even like uh, voice assistants that we, that we use all the time. But there are always objections, OK? So we've now got, got to that point. Let's try and really discuss at least a few of the objections. Now, I think that he discussed in his own essay seven or eight of them, and um, kind of like with JJC Smart, I kind of I just want to talk about the ones that were the most interesting and important. So I'm going to jump around a little bit, talking about objections to Turing's belief that machines would be conscious if they could pass the Turing test. Well, what are the objections? There's a couple different ones. So one is this objection. It's called the mathematical objection. Hmm. So remember, as we've learned throughout our whole class, objections are just 
reasons to disagree with um, the conclusion of somebody's argument. Like, what are some rational, reasonable bases to find fault with his whole account here that computers would have consciousness if they did well on this game? One objection. Okay. So this objection basically says that um, for certain mathematical reasons, for certain technical reasons, there are some questions that a computer uh, would never be able to give an answer to. And that, you could argue, is what shows that that's not really real consciousness, because a human being doesn't have that type of limit. You could, you could argue that a human being, like me or you, if we are posed with a question, we can come up with some type of answer, no matter what the question is. Uh, but a computer, because of certain computational limitations that they have, and for certain mathematical reasons, which is a little bit beyond us to go into, but for certain technical reasons, there are, there are questions which we know that the computer could not decide an answer for. And so it would either say undefined or it would just cannot compute, it would time out. So let me write that here. Um, for technical reasons, there are certain questions that the um, computer could never answer. Um, unlike a human. So they must not have consciousness. Okay, so that's the objection. Um, to give you just the very briefest outline of what these so-called technical reasons are all about. There's this famous uh, mathematician and logician from the 20th century, a German man named um, Kurt Gödel. It's actually spelled, I'll spell it here. So his name, just for the sake of reference. That's how it's spelled, Kurt uh, now in English, it looks like Gödel, but in German, and the reason I can't put it in is because I don't have special characters, but there would be an umlaut over the O, like two dots above it, and that makes the a little more guttural O sound, Gödel. So Kurt Gödel is this famous logician. He published a very well-known um, postulate and theorem in math, which is called the undecidability theorem, or sometimes called the incompleteness theorem. What it proved is that within any formal system, like a mathematical system or a computer programming system, uh, there are certain questions that the system itself cannot answer within its own parameters. Um, I don't know if this is the best example of this, but for example, if you ask a, a calculator to try and divide a positive number by zero, it doesn't return any result because that is an undefined operation in mathematics. So. Um, so there are basically certain questions which, if given to a particular type of um, computing system, it would just not be able to compute an answer. But we're not like that, so maybe they're not really conscious like, like we are. But Alan Turing has a reply to this. He has a, he has a response to all the objections, because remember, he's the guy who believes that they will have consciousness. So he speaks about the objection, then he tries to knock it down. So what is his reply to this one? Um, I'll talk to you about his reply. I'm going to erase this, and then I'll talk about his reply on the new clean board. <clears throat> so here's Turing's reply to the mathematical objection. He says, it's a clever response. He says, actually, not so fast. Um, the human being, the human brain, is really no different here than the computer is, because... Um, the human brain also has certain questions that it could not answer. We just don't often think about those questions because they're, you know, they're mind-boggling and they kind of hurt your head to think about. But there are some questions that if we are asked, 
we just kind of are like, I don't know, I can't say it. I have no answer for that. So the point made here is that there are limitations of human uh, brains as well. And so although, yes, computers have questions they cannot provide answers for, so do we. And therefore, there's not really a difference. If there's a difference, it's a difference of degree, but not of kind. So, um, I a better marker maybe. Okay, it says there are also questions that we could not answer, so actually we are no different. Um, let me try and throw out some questions that might be like that. Uh, can you tell me, what is the biggest number? What, what is it? Just, just say it, what is it? Um, I don't know, now you might be trying to think, okay, what is it, is it infinity? And that makes some sense, right? But what we've learned actually in set theory is that if you take um, a set of all natural numbers, which is infinitely large, and then you raise that to a, the, the power of that set. Um, if you take the power set of infinity, which is to take the set of all of its subsets, then you actually generate a new infinity, which is larger than the first one. That goes from countably infinite to uncountably infinite. Um, so in fact, there's no way that you can stop the reification of the next infinite set. You could take the power set of the power set of the power set and on and on and on to no end. So in a way, it's like impossible to say the answer. Or if I ask you, what is the smallest number? You're not going to be able to say much there either because for any number that you give, it can be divided by two. Um, so you can continue to just expand the decimal position of zeros out further um, and add another zero to make the number smaller. So it seems like there's no limitation to how big or small a number could get, and that's mind-boggling. What if I ask you, um, does the universe have a beginning? Um, yes or no? You probably can't really tell me that either because either way you go sounds kind of uh, puzzling. To say that it's been there forever would mean that it, what, it doesn't have a beginning? I mean, how could something exist but never had a beginning? On the other hand, if you say that it has no beginning, uh, or sorry, that it did have a beginning, then that means it came from nothing, because before everything, there had to be nothing. So how can the thing come from nothing? That seems to violate uh, conservation of energy and laws of physics. So there are some questions that I guess we are also not in a position to be able to answer. Um, and therefore, he says, don't think that you're really too much different than the computer that has computational limits beyond which you cannot provide sensible um, responses. Okay, so that's one objection and one response. Um, let me go to another one, jumping around to the next. Let's see if this is better. Okay, so here's another objection. This is the objection from consciousness. Okay, objection from consciousness. Sorry, I'm just trying to check on some of these markers. This one's good. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about it at first, and then I'll put some information on the board. The objection from consciousness is basically saying this. Uh, look, even if the machine does really well in the game, and you can't really tell much the difference between it and the person, so what? I mean, it doesn't actually have real consciousness, though, because when it gives an answer, it's not actually feeling anything or thinking anything on the inside. It's just an input and an output condition. So this is a computer program when, when certain like uh, characters and symbols are inputted into it in the form of a question, it just generates a response. But it's not because it's thinking about the question and it's not because it's feeling or remembering anything about the answer. So you can argue that despite how well they do in the game, they don't actually think or feel anything on the inside. And that's why it's not real consciousness, like what we have. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay. 
no matter how well the machine does in the game, It doesn't have consciousness because it is not feeling or thinking anything on the inside. Okay, kind of. Feel like you can grasp that objection? It's basically saying, yeah, that um, that's just behavior that it's displaying. That's just like um, the exhibition of an output providing that there was an input given. But that's not the same thing as actually like having thoughts. So if you ask me, um, what is your greatest fear? I'm gonna have like these anxious thoughts about stuff that has scared me in my life. And I'm gonna have memories of those things as I'm trying to give you the answer. But if you ask it to the computer, you know, even if it gives you a really detailed answer, like, oh, I'm so afraid of heights, you know, every time I'm up there, my knees are just, like, shaking, and um, it reminds me of, like, uh, this one time that I fell when I was young. Like, even if it gave you a really detailed answer that sounds like only a human could have given that, you might think, well, that's not just because it's actually feeling anything, though. That's just sort of triggered as, um, you know, a kind of sophisticated pattern of, uh, linguistic expression that the computer programmer wanted it to show. Now, what's the reply to this? Uh, Turing has a reply to this one as well, and it's pretty clever. So what he says is, um, okay, so the objection basically is saying this, that you think the machine does not have consciousness because you're saying it doesn't feel anything on the inside. But basically, how do you know that? I guess it's because you think it doesn't, but how can you verify that? I mean, at the end of the day, whose consciousness can you experience from an inside first person point of view? Only yours. What about all the other human beings? What makes you think that they have consciousness and that you're not like the one and only human on this planet that was not born as a zombie who just exhibits behavior but doesn't really have feelings and thoughts? How do you know that other people have consciousness? Well, you based it off of their behavior because they look and think and they act. I shouldn't say look, but they act and they talk and they behave as though they have consciousness. The only possible method that you can use to evaluate whether something has consciousness is to observe its behavior and judge it based on that. But you cannot, let's say, be that other being having those thoughts and feeling them have the thoughts from the inside. So what he's saying is if, if you are skeptical about machines having consciousness until the day comes when you can be the machine and feel from the inside that it really has thoughts, then you're waiting for a standard that's impossible to fulfill because you'll never have any other consciousness besides your own. And so you're an observer of everyone else's consciousness and behavior, the computer and the human alike. So he says if observable behavior is the only way to test whether something has consciousness, then when these machines are observed to behave in a way that looks like it's consciousness, you've got to give it up and say, well, that's consciousness there. Do you understand? So what he's saying is this is uh, imposing upon us a justification that we cannot possibly give. You can't possibly uh, determine that others have consciousness through the internal experience of their thoughts. You can only judge that they have consciousness by observing the external presentation of their behavior that they exhibit. So the computer has to be judged the same way as everybody else. And when it's behaving as though it's conscious, why should we say otherwise? Okay, so that's the reply. I'll put a little piece of info on that here. So the criteria for judging whether things have consciousness is based on observation of them. Um, it's not possible for you to do any other way. Um, the first person experience of consciousness that you have is just limited to your own. So 
if it's all based on judging off of behavior, then machines, when they behave the way conscious beings do, should be thought of as conscious beings. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm just going to talk about this one for a moment because I didn't think it was the biggest and most important one, but it's interesting enough to make a passing comment. Another objection is called the objection from various disabilities. That objection says that, um, look, maybe these computers will do really well in the game and they'll fool you into thinking they're a person, but there's so many things that they will never do uh, that people do, and that's the thing that shows that they don't have real consciousness like what we've got. Um, and what could these so-called disabilities be? I'll read what he said about it. <clears throat> So he imagines the critic saying, I grant that you can make machines do the things you've mentioned, but you'll never be able to make them do X. X could be be kind, resourceful, beautiful, friendly, have initiative, have a sense of humor, tell right from wrong, make mistakes, fall in love, enjoy strawberries and cream. That's a true British author saying that. Uh, make someone fall in love with it, learn from experience, be the subject of its own thought. Do something really new. Okay. Now, his response to this objection is, is pretty basic. He says, um, why would you claim that the machine couldn't do some of those things? It's not because they can't do it. It's just because so far they haven't done it yet. And in 1950, of course, computers hadn't done any of those things yet. But what he's talking about are all future computers that are possible in the future, not just the ones that exist today. So he says you must just have like a limitation of imagination if you think that just because we've never seen man-made uh, machines doing any of those things that they never ever would. Why shouldn't they be able to do it in the future? Furthermore, he says some of these disabilities that are claimed are not even relevant to the question of whether a machine has consciousness. One of the things put in there was eat strawberries and cream. Okay, now think about it. If we wanted to make computers that had the ability to eat and digest food and then deposit waste. Could we do that? Sure. We could build a digestion module into the computing system so that like in the mouth, you can put food in, it'll puree it, put it in a receptacle, and then later deposit it somewhere else so that it simulates the experience that we all have of eating. But what would be the point of that? It's not like the computer needs to eat to be alive because it doesn't function biologically like a, a natural life form would. So although we could make it do some of those things, it wouldn't even be relevant to the question of whether it has consciousness. And in terms of the other disabilities which are more relevant, who says that they won't be able to do that someday? Okay, now the last one. I'll just go with the last one. This is called Lady Loveless's Objection. <clears throat> Okay, so Turing had this friend of his um, named Lady Loveless, and they would engage in all kinds of deep, interesting conversations about his ideas, about his work, um, and she would challenge and test his ideas and sometimes, you know, give him criticisms to think about. So because he liked those conversations and because he respected her intellect, uh, he puts her name in the essay and refers to her here. So here was her objection, which I think is one of the best and most interesting ones. It's the basic idea that the computer doesn't have real consciousness because it can only do what it has been programmed to do. It can only do what it's been programmed to do, but a human being, you might say, is different because we can just do any random thing. We can be totally spontaneous, creative, um, do something completely unpredictable, but a machine or a computer is limited to the uh, confines of what the programming it has received. Machines will never have consciousness because uh, they can only do what they have been programmed to do, unlike us. Okay, 
what about that objection? So he has a reply to this too, which is yet again, I think, pretty inventive. And it's a similar type of reply as the one given to the mathematical objection. So here's what he's programmed to do. What Turing says back is that actually, the human brain also is the same way. You and I and our human brains, we can also only do the experience. But um, for example, could you have talked to a friend about the uh, Turing test three months ago? Probably not. I mean, unless you already had advanced knowledge of this subject, but I don't think you could have otherwise, obviously. And But now you can. What's the difference between you at the beginning of the semester and you today, where before you couldn't have said anything to a person about Turing, but now you can? The reason is because now information's been imparted on, unto you from me and from this book. It didn't generate from within you and bubble up from an internal source. The information is given to you from outside. Let's talk about, um, say, a baby's born today. You know, like, whatever, Elon Musk's baby was born on May the 4th. But anyway, today it's the 7th. Say a baby's born today in this interesting time. Can that baby talk on day one? No. But fast forward 10 years later, and you got a fifth grader that's talking and saying all kinds of stuff. Now, what happened? How did they learn to talk? Well, it's not because they just figured it out on their own and it came from inside. They had to be exposed to the vocabulary and grammar and instructed in that by their teachers, by their community, and by um, their parents. In fact, feral children, children that have been abandoned to like wolves and grown up in the wild with no parents, there have been cases of that. And uh, they don't learn how to speak language because they didn't receive the proper uh, nurture for the natural capacity they had to acquire it. So um, whether it's speech, riding a bike, playing an instrument, learning a new language, uh, you're not gonna just take in info. You can take in a lot. You can take it in, in some cases, pretty fast. But um, it could be just thought of as a very, very powerful supercomputer is sitting up there on top of your head. Uh, but it's similar to every other computer in the sense that it can only reflect on and access and interpret information which it has been given from somewhere else. So if you, um, I don't know, learn a new language starting today, you're going to have to study that language from an external um, guide of some kind, whether it's an instructor, whether it's a book, whether it's an online tutorial. You're going to have to focus on something outside of you to bring the information into your mind. So isn't that a clever reply that uh, although we don't necessarily usually think much about it, because we just reflect on the things that we already know. We ourselves can't talk about, act on, or reflect on information aside from that which we've been given from some external source. So we kind of have to rely on our own uh, programming, except in our case, the programming is all of our social and environmental inputs instead of literally a computer program. Okay, so uh, that closes the discussion of Turing. Remember now that Turing's argument that machines could have consciousness tends to be supportive of the physicalist position because it would uh, be like a proof of concept maybe that a physical object can in fact think because um, nobody really thinks that the machine has a soul. Nobody thinks that when you build a machine in a you know, factory, you're, you're putting souls into them and stuff. So if we built machines that had consciousness, it would seem like, yeah, consciousness can just generate from physical stuff, from pure matter. Um, and that would be supportive of physicalism. But you've heard the objections too, and you might be a person who thought, no, the objections were pretty solid, and Turing did not convince me of his claim. So it's an open question. There's a lot of fun movies too on that topic, right? The whole artificial intelligent uh, robot, and you're wondering, is it thinking, or is it, you know, even, <laughs> is it moral? Is it gonna harm me? Like Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick, or um, Ex Machina a little more recently, the movie Her by Spike Jones. So interesting topic, but now we're all done with our philosophy of mind stuff. That means you have every every note that you might need if you chose to write on any of those paper topics because the, the topics were knowledge, time, or, or mind. So now with that, you've got everything you need if you chose to write on a mind subject too. Um, have I seen her? Oh yeah, it's a great movie. I thought that was a good one. It won the Oscar, right, for best screenplay. Um, yeah, it was touching film, and I mean, I also think that uh, Joaquin Phoenix, you know, who just won Best Actor for uh, for the the Joker, he, he's a great actor too. I think he's one of the greats living right now. So, no, good film. Anybody who hasn't seen it, go back, watch Hurts. It's really cool. Um, but okay, 
let's go on. So we've now finished another topic, and um, we only have a little bit of time in today's meeting to talk briefly about the last one. And so we're going to dive right into one more short mini topic. <clears throat> and what it is is life and death. Okay. Life and death. Um, <clears throat> so it's obviously one of the most uh, difficult and personal things to discuss and to think about, the concept of life and death. Um, we human beings, we're all living a life, and we want our lives to go well. And the question then is, what would make a life go well? What would make a human being's life go as, as pretty much as well as it could? You are going to learn that there have been phil philosophical accounts of the good life that go all the way back to the ancient Greeks, and there are different ideas of that that we still talk, talk about today. Um, so philosophers have tried to provide reasonable arguments as to what would make a human being's life go well, and we're going to try and examine at least a couple of those views. The other thing is death. Um, death is inevitable. Is it bad? Is it something that we should fear or that we should have anxiety about? Or is death not bad? Um, there are arguments on either side of that question, too. And so is there a rational response or a reasonable perspective that one should take towards the matter of death? So we'll try at least to briefly touch on either side of that. What would make a life well-lived, and what's the proper response to the fact of death? Um, okay, so the first author on this that we're going to look on is Plato. So one more look at the ancient Greek Plato. I'm going to move this notebook away real quick. Plato had a very interesting account of what would make a human being's life go well. So we're starting with him. <clears throat> Plato, the great classical ancient Greek philosopher from thousands of years ago, 428 to 347 before the Common Era. That's 2,400 years ago, basically when he was born, 2,428 years ago is when he was born. And um, he had written a book, which is called The Republic, sometimes famously known as Plato's Republic. Um, that's considered his classic work, the most important um, piece of writing that he left behind is, is The Republic. The Republic contains a very detailed argument about what would be the ideal form of human society to live in. Like what would be the ideal state or form of government. That's the Republic. It's like a utopian vision of an ideal, perfected society. And um, so the whole book is about that. What would it take to have the best society possible? And closer to the end of the book, he tries to connect that to what it would be for a human individual life to go as well as possible. So in our textbook, they took a section out of the Republic and they retitled it On the Harmony of the Soul. So that's what you'll find in our own um, textbook for the class, On the Harmony of the Soul. That's not actually, in reality, not called On the Harmony of the Soul. It's just a piece of the book, The Republic. But, you know, since they've taken it out and used it as snippet, a snippet in this text, they wanted to give it an original title. Okay, so from Plato's Republic, On the Harmony of the Soul, we're going to hear about his viewpoint on what would make a human life go as well as it could possibly go. And that's a question that I think all of us can find some interest in because we're living lives. And uh, I know that you want your life to go well, at least. Sometimes people have a pretty narrow conception of things and they don't necessarily take too much of an interest in other people's lives, which is sad because we're all in this together. But even if that's true of a person, most people are not so neutral about their own life. Like Regarding your life, I'm sure most people don't just say, hey, who cares? Good, bad, or ugly, it could go any type of way, and I don't mind. Most people want their life to go well. And so this maybe gives you some sense of rational guidance as to what at least one very intelligent philosopher thought about that. What would make a human being's life go well? So he's speaking to us from beyond the grave. He's speaking to us from thousands of years ago. We're learning from him a little bit. So let's see what he thought. Um, for me to give you the picture of what Plato says makes a good human life, we got to start off with what makes a good society, because he builds a bridge from that. 
he models the description of what is a perfect or ideal human life from the discussion of what he thinks would make the ideal republic. So we're going to first start off with a real fast crash course in Plato's Republic. This is something that historians and scholars and philosophers, some of them spend a substantial amount of time in their life studying. So we're going to at least take you know, a few minutes to go over some of it. Um, in Plato's Republic, he believed that society should be divided into three parts, that the ideal republic, it would be separated into three main parts. So there's three main parts of the republic. Okay, so one of the three is um, what he calls the merchants. Now, merchants, that's the largest class within society. That's where most of the members of the society, most of the citizens are. This is the equivalent of people who just are working a trade or a craft for some type of profit. So like the equivalent of our modern day um, small business owners or just working class people who produce goods and services which they could trade or sell for a profit. So that's it. Um, people who produce goods and services which they trade or sell for a profit. Merchants. Um, sometimes the terminology is used artisans, so I've seen he'll use both words kind of interchangeably, but they both mean the same thing. I prefer using the label merchant because artisan, someone might look at that and get the false association that it's an artist, but it means just a person who makes stuff of any kind. So yeah, um, if a person owns and operates a landscaping business, a car wash uh, service, um, a street sweeping company, um, a retail establishment, a restaurant, you know, any good or any service that people might want to buy or trade for, that's what merchants provide, and they do that for a profit. So that's the big class of society, that's the largest class, but it's not the only one. There's two other important parts, and they each have different roles in the society. So the second part he talks about are the warriors, which he calls warriors. Now, this group is like the uh, equivalent of our police and military, and uh, if like National Guard or other security forces exist. So their job is to provide for the defense of the Republic. So they're the ones that are supposed to be called into duty to defend it against either external threats or internal um, instability, and you know to make sure that there's civil order and also safe and secure from invasion and attack. So they. Uh, defend and protect the Republic defend and protect the Republic against those two things that I mentioned either external threats like foreign invasion or internal instability so if there were like riots or um, a threat to civil order and peace and stability they could come in and restore that peace and that order. Um, so that's a different part of society, right? They're, it's a totally different job. The merchants, they make goods and services and they trade for a profit. They, they produce things. And these people don't make or sell anything. They provide their defense as their contribution to the system. Um, now, there's a third part in the Republic, and this is perhaps the most important of all, uh, because the third part are the kings. <clears throat> so, kings. So basically what the kings do is, as you might imagine, uh, they're the political leadership uh, class of the society. So these are like the heads of state, basically, or in the modern day, they can be presidents, prime ministers, actual monarchs, if such there be, or if there are um, government by committee, like, uh, like a parliamentary system where those people uh, institute the laws, then they could be seen in this role as well. So those are just the people who create the rules in the society. They, they impose the rules and the policies. They're also the ones who can 
order the warrior class into service, like to call them to fight. So, um, So it might be a little hard to read that. I'm going to type it just to make sure that you can see it. But these are their function is to rule and to create the policies, and also to have uh, exert control and authority over the warriors, um, and the whole society, but but especially those warriors. So Okay, so now, there's these three parts of the Republic. What Plato thought was that the system is going to be in its ideal form. It's going to be um, a just and well-ordered society if each of the three parts of the Republic do their job and don't try to overstep their boundaries to do the jobs of other parts. So the merchants should do what the merchants do, but not try to overstep their bounds and mess with what the kings do or the warriors. The warriors should fight and defend, but they shouldn't, let's say, like try to overthrow the kings like in a military coup and take control over the system. The kings should institute policy and make decisions about when the military is to be used, but they shouldn't perhaps micromanage battlefield decisions because that's something that warriors are better equipped to do. So each part of the society has an important function to perform. The merchants to provide the goods and services that you know power the um, trade and economic output of the system. The warriors that provide for its physical defense and security, and the kings who wisely and intelligently oversee and institute policy and create rules. Now, what he thought was that if each of the three parts does its own job and does it well, then that's a society that's working well and that is in a great um, state of harmony and is flourishing. I have to give you a little bit more background exactly, though, about how people were placed into these categories, because that's an interesting point in Plato's Republic. And it shows a little difference between his system and our modern-day uh, Western-style democracy. So <clears throat> in you know modern-day contemporary American and other liberal democracies around the world, we tell people uh, that if you want to do anything in this life, then you're free to at least make an attempt. So um, it's not supposed to be that you're required um, to join one type of profession in your life. Even if you're most well suited to it, you can do something different. So for example, if a person today in America is like the biggest, strongest, brawniest person who really would be a great soldier, but what they really want to do is just operate a flower shop, they're free to do that. You know, They don't have to act according to the aptitude they have as a, a fighting person. Or on the other hand, maybe they want to join um, political life and run for office, uh, even though they are better <laughs> with physical ability than intellectual, right? Take another case. You can imagine a person, they're the smartest, brainiest person who would be an excellent leader. But what they really want to do is just join the police force and provide safety to their community. And, and in our world, we say that's totally fine and you can do anything you really want. But in Plato's system, it was different. The, the, the view of the Republic is that you're going to be put into the part of society where you are proven to be most capable. Not just where you want to go, but where you ought to be for the betterment of the whole system. So there would be this rigorous uh, pro process of education and testing that would put people into whichever section of the society where they were most uh, appropriately fit. So basically, in your early education in the Republic, you would take like a long course of study in all kinds of subjects, math, gymnastics, music. And like that's the equivalent of our like K through 12 primary schooling. But when you reach the end of that train of, of, of study, you're going to be asked to take a big exam in the, in the Republic. 
You take this big comprehensive exam that tests you on all those subjects that you've been learning about throughout your childhood. And then there's going to be one out of two possible outcomes of that test. One way it could go is uh, you pass. Another way that it could go is that you didn't pass. Suppose that when you took this big exam at the conclusion of your primary schooling, you didn't do well and you, and you failed. Then in that case, boom, you're going to the warrior class. You just get put there because if you failed this first big comprehensive exam, then the judgment of the Republic is you're not the, the leading intellectual lights of this system and therefore you're not fit to serve in one of the other roles. That doesn't mean that what you are doing though is any less important to the Republic because warriors are crucial for its overall strength and stability. But if you're not good enough intellectually to pass that first test, then maybe your physical capacity is where you're gonna make the most contribution to society. But suppose you pass that first big test, right? That means that you get appointed to a secondary course of higher education. So now you're on to your secondary schooling where the subjects get a little more advanced and the expectations get raised a bit. At the end of that process, you're gonna be tested yet again a second time. And once again, two outcomes could happen, passage or failure. Suppose that you failed at that second step. You cleared the first hurdle, but you stalled out at the second one. Then in that case, the belief of the Republic was you should be put into the merchant class because you do have some intellectual skills and talents gained and sharpened over time through all that formal education. But since you were not the absolute cream of the crop that passed that second test with flying colors, you're not going to be able to go even further with your education to eventually get into the rank of the kings. That's what would happen if you pass that second test. If you pass the second test now, you get appointed to an even higher course of tertiary education, which extends well into your adult life and even your middle age. But when that is done, and you finish with that, you just enter the ranks of the kings. So notice how people assume <clears throat> leadership positions in the republic. It's not based on a democratic electoral process. It's not that you go and run for office, and if you capture a majority of the public that votes, then you will become the leader of the society. It's not democracy at all. And in fact, Plato is very clear about that. He says repeatedly that democracy is dangerous and bad. And so he's not a fan of it at all. He thought that the problem with democracy is that you could have a charismatic person who could um, appeal to a majority share of the voters, but that would not be intellectually capable of actually being a good leader. And then that type of person would exert corrupt rule, which would lead to the destruction of the state. So in Plato's system, there's a guarantee that the people who become the leaders are extremely intelligent and wise because they have to prove it through actual rigorous academic evaluation. Um, so you kind of earn your place through demonstrated intellectual merit to become a king in their platonic system. It's not based on a democratic election. And he said that Democracy is going to lead to a tyranny of the majority. In his view, until and unless the republic system is instituted in a society, there's going to be a perpetual cycle of three non-ideal systems, democracy, tyranny, and oligarchy. So what Plato believed is that unless you have this republic set up, as he's described it, you're going to perpetually revolve between those other three uh, systems. So take the case of democracy. He says democracy will last a while until there's a tyrant that assumes power by capturing a majority of the votes through charisma and through populism. Once that person gets established into power, they're gonna dismantle the democratic systems and therefore consolidate power and become a tyrant. Now we don't have a democracy, we have a tyranny and like a monarchy. Um, when the tyranny reaches its end, it's because a powerful group of elite members of society overthrow the tyrant, like how Caesar, for example, was killed by his men. Now it becomes an oligarchy. But eventually, public pressure on the oligarchs causes them to restore power to the people and democracy is reinstituted until later a tyrant comes back and the whole system just keeps going on and on. And Plato said to get out of that kind of vicious cycle, you have to establish this republic. So, I mean, it's definitely got some broad similarities to modern day uh, systems of government because we see that there are definitely functions of society that match those descriptions here, but there are definitely dissimilarities. We're in a democracy or at least somewhat a democracy, of course, and 
uh, Plato would not have liked that, and he would be warning us for the possibility of you know tyrannical rule by tyrann tyranny of the majority when the poor leadership assumes power. But anyway, you got these three classes, and that that story I just told you is the story of how people would be sorted into the various categories within the Republic, which according to Plato would be just and righteous. So if every member of society is in their appropriate part of the Republic, doing their job for the benefit of the whole, not overstepping their boundaries and willfully submitting to the right rule of the Kings, that's a good society. One more thing about those Kings. Uh, Plato said that these kings in the ideal republic would be philosopher kings. This is a phrase he uses over and over, philosopher kings, which means that in his view, in a perfected society, the people that run the society would be, I guess, like people like me, you know, people who actually are academic philosophers, because he thinks that it's a requirement that you're wise and that you're intelligent. And, you know, for whatever reason, I guess he thinks philosophers, it makes sense, are reasonable people, because the heart of the whole subject is trying to pursue wisdom and loving it. So he would have thought that, you know, the wisest among us should be the ones that are uh, able to serve as kings. Um, it shouldn't be based on popularity or anything else. Um, <clears throat> now, there's virtues of each of the three parts of the Republic, too, and that's the next point I have to discuss. So Now, the word virtue, as the Greeks used it, what it means is a, an attribute or a quality that if you have it, then you're able to perform your function very well. So virtue. A quality that a thing has when it is able to perform its function excellently well. So it's a quality that a thing has when it's able to do its function very, very well. When it's able to do its task or its job, you could say, at a very high level, then it has the virtue distinctive of it. Now, um, to help you understand this with a quick example, take the case of a uh, kitchen knife, right? Now, what's the function of a kitchen knife? What is it there to do? What is its job or task? That should be easy enough. What do we have these knives for? Um, what are they there to do for us? Easy enough to say. <clears throat> the kitchen knife was created for the purpose of cutting things. Exactly, yes. And um, so that's its function. What quality then, what virtue is the virtue of the kitchen knife? I'm asking you this. What is the quality that if it has it, it's able to do its job of cutting very well. So what feature makes a knife a good knife that's good at cutting? Exactly, sharpness. So sharpness is the virtue of knives. A sharp knife is a good knife because a sharp knife cuts well, and that's what knives are there to do. A dull knife is not so good because it's not even very good at cutting, which is the whole point of having a knife. Okay, so with that example in mind, we're going to apply this topic or concept to the three parts of the Republic. Each of the three parts of the Republic has a job to do for the society. And so just as much as with the knife where sharpness is its virtue, each of the three parts of the Republic doing its job also would have a virtue in the ideal case, which would allow it to do its job very, very well. So what is the virtue of each part? Okay. The virtue of the merchants is what is called temperance. Temperance. Now, what does this word temperance mean? Temperance is basically moderation and self-control when it comes to your desires and the things that you want. So it's the ability to hold back on getting too greedy or too filled up with wanting and longing for things that you abandon your better judgment or that you start to act foolishly. So 
having moderation and self-control is temperance. So that's what that is. <clears throat> So when merchants are good merchants, they have self-control, they have temperance, meaning that they can curb their appetites. They can hold back on the desires that they have. If they don't have temperance, then when they're making goods and services, they're going to get too greedy and they're going to start trying to gouge the price of those goods and services and maybe to produce lower quality goods and services, which is going to be to the disadvantage and to the detriment of the society as a whole. So people out there trading goods and services for profit, they're going to corrupt the society and defraud it if they start selling you a false bill of goods or at an inflated rate for inferior quality products. So should they be able to make money selling and trading things? Sure, that's what they're there for. But they have to be able to hold it within certain reasonable limits. Otherwise, they'll become so greedy and corrupt that they will undermine the society. Not only will they rip people off, but they'll also perhaps try to exert undue influence over the leaderships, uh, over the kings. And if they did that, then they might also further corrupt the society um, from a financial perspective. So merchants, their job is to produce goods and services that we all need, and yes, they should profit off of that but they have to do so in a way that exhibits some restraint, some moderation, because otherwise they'll get out of control, become corrupt, and now all of a sudden we have overly priced goods of inferior quality and we're not living as a happy society. So that's one thing that's important. Temperance is the virtue of the merchants. Good merchants have a little moderation and self-control. Next we've got these warriors, okay? The warriors, as we've said, they're there for defense. They're there to provide for security. and uh, defending the Republic. Their virtue is basically simply just courage. That's the virtue of the warrior's courage. So courage, as you probably know, is just the willingness to face danger, to take a personal risk of harm when it's necessary and right. So <clears throat> willing uh, to face danger, to do what is needed. Willing to face danger, to do what's needed, that's courage, sometimes called bravery. Um, <clears throat> so think about warriors, right? What's their function? It's not to cut vegetables, it's to defend a society. But how can you really be good as a fighting soldier, police officer, security force? How can you be good at that if you're not brave, if you're afraid to face danger, then when danger happens, as it inevitably will in that line of work, you're gonna try and run away from the source of danger instead of doing what you need to do to, to uh, restore peace and civil order. So. You don't want the next time you know you call the police for some emergency for them to arrive at the scene and be like, whoa, 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 this is too dangerous. I'm just going to have to let you guys handle this. That's not a good police officer. You don't want a firefighter or somebody who shows up at the blazing inferno and says, okay, you know what? I got to quit. This is I'm not in the, this line of work is a little too risky for me. So some people in society have to take risks in order to provide for the basic safety and welfare of everybody else. That's the warrior's job. So if they're good warriors, they're ready to face that danger. They're willing to do it. They're willing to put their lives on the line. They're willing to risk their safety in order to provide for everybody else's safety. So courage is the virtue of warriors. How could they be good warriors if they had if they were cowards? Okay, so finally we get to the kings. And the virtue of kings is, is critical because they're the leaders and they run everything. They impose the rules. They have authority over the other parts of the republic, especially the warriors. The virtue they would have would just be wisdom. That's what he says, wisdom. Wisdom is just the ability to make good, to make good judgments 
and to have uh, the ability to make long-range planning. So, <clears throat> good judgment, intelligence, and planning. All right, good judgment, being wise. Being wise means having good judgment, being smart, and being able to plan things out in the future, having good long-range plans. So the people that are up there in the highest position of leadership, if they're not wise, if they're not intelligent, then they're going to lead the society that they're running into the ground to its ruin. Plato worried about that. You know, He said, if you have a society which is led by uh, idiotic people, imbeciles, people that have no intellectual capacity, then how are you going to entrust them with the most sophisticated and difficult decisions that leaders have to make? Um, so you can't be a good leader if you're not smart. You can't be a good leader if you don't have wisdom. So that was the point of putting people through all that education before they're even qualified to enter the ranks of the kings. And they wouldn't have the ability to do it if they didn't surpass the objective standards that uh, that are set forth. Okay, so now back to our big picture. What makes a society go well? When all the members of society, this is Plato's view, when all the members of society are classified and sorted into their appropriate uh, part, when each of the parts does its own work and not the work of others, and when they operate according to the virtue that is distinctive of them. That's when society's working well, and when you live in that type of society, you're living in a just and well-ordered society where everyone is flourishing. Um, so the lower parts should not try to overthrow or challenge the rule of the, um, the kings. They should each do their job but not try to vie for supremacy over one another, cooperatively uh, function to provide for the best overall society. Now, what I'm going to tell you next is that according to Plato, the soul of a human individual, me and you, is much like the Republic, but it's sort of a miniature version of the Republic. Each human being is like a microcosm of the state. And that means that there are parallels, according to him, between the Republic and between the individual. So he thought that each human soul had three parts. And he basically structured his description of them along the same lines you see here. So I'm going to now try to make that connection for you guys between the three parts of the Republic. We're going to take that leap to the three parts of the human soul. And there are various similarities between each of those three. They're almost like a mirror image of each other. So we've talked about the three parts of the Republic. I'm going to clear the board, and I'll create the room then for the three parts of the human soul. Okay, so we have three parts of this human soul, another three-part division um, in this essay or in this book. First of all, there's a part which he calls the appetitive part. Okay, the appetitive part of the soul is the part of your soul that has appetites. That's the part of you that has desires and appetites, as the name indicates, appetitive. So when you want something, that could be of anything. It doesn't have to, obviously it's not just literally food appetite, but that's part of it. Uh, it could be that you want to have some types of experiences, some types of possessions, maybe some types of relationships. Anything that you're yearning for, that you want, but you don't yet have it, when you think about, I want that, I hope I get that. When will I get that? That's the appetitive part of your soul that's active right there. That's one major aspect of us, according to Plato and the Greeks. See, they believe that we do have a soul, and they thought that it was divided among itself into different parts, like the system of the Republic is. So one part of it is the appetitive part. Now, that part of the soul is supposed to be roughly correlative or corresponds to the merchant class of the society, okay? Because the similarity is this. The merchants are trying to produce goods and services, but why? Because they want to profit and they want to gain wealth and income from that. 
So the desire that the merchants have to accumulate wealth based on the sale or transaction of their goods is similar to the part of your soul that desires whatever, wealth, experiences, possessions, property, food of, of, of any kind, you know? So um, the appetitive part of you kind of is a stand-in for the merchant class in the Republic. What's the key link? They're both based on desire for something. The merchants want money and wealth and all the things that it can provide. And the appetitive part of your soul is just that desirous um, part of you that expresses appetites or wants for whatever. Okay, now, another part of your soul, the second part, is called the spirited part. Okay, now, the spirited part of your soul is the part of your soul that um, it's competitive, it's proud, it, um, it's got a lot of passion and pride. So it hates disrespect and dishonor. Um, it likes to exhibit skill. Um, it likes to win, hates to lose. It's the part of you that would, let's say, um, be willing to fight if necessary to defend either yourself or other people that you value or just values that you care a lot about. Um, it's the part of you that if you played in a sport, it would be the part driving you to compete hard and to come out victorious. So that's another part of you, the passionate, spirited part of you. And maybe you could guess, this is supposed to be equivalent to or somewhat parallel to the warrior class of the Republic. Because, right, the warriors fight and defend the Republic through their passionate, spirited nature. And the part within you that's that fighter that has a lot of pride and that would hate dishonor. That's the spirited part within you. Okay. So when you're out there cheering on your favorite team or something, or you're at the, you know, uh, the football game for your high school or college, um, that's the spirited part of you. If you're competing in the game, it would also be the same. If somebody disrespected you and you felt like uh, you, you have to restore your honor and dignity in the light of that, now it's your spirited part that's kind of taking over. Okay. A third part of the human soul, and this is critical because this is the part, as now you can tell, that's supposed to be somewhat similar to the kings. That's the ruler and the thing that runs the whole show. The third part of your soul is just the rational part. So that's like basically the smart part of you. That's the part of you that sets aside emotions sets aside desires, and just tries to make the correct rational decision based on evidence and logic. So the rational part of you is the discerning judge that is capable of making clear-headed and reasonable choices based on the right facts and the good judgment. So that's like the kinks. Now, <clears throat> in the same way that there's a virtue for each of the three parts of the republic, there's a virtue for each of the three parts of your soul. And so you should try to get these parts of your soul to operate according to that virtue. And the virtue of each of the parts is exactly the same as the virtue of the correlative part of the Republic. So the virtue of your appetitive part is temperance, once again. The virtue of your spirited part, that's courage, bravery. And the virtue of your rational part is wisdom. So how should you be living your life according to this man, Plato? Well, you should try and get your soul in order, basically. Get the parts of your soul to be balanced and harmonious. Get each part to work according to the virtue that is relevant to it. So you've got appetites and stuff, right? You want things, and that's fine, and that's good. But make sure that you have a little bit of self-control over it so that it doesn't get carried away and that you don't become too greedy and too foolish in the pursuit of the desires that you do have, right? Um, so bring a little dose of healthy self-moderation and restraint <laughs> to your appetites. Then you'll have temperance there. Okay, come on, you got to choose. You want to stand up? You want to sit down? What's up? Let's go. Okay, now, the spirited part. Um, you have a part of you inside that's willing to fight if necessary, that's willing to defend and protect values that you hold dear, that's willing to compete, that wants to be recognized with honor. 
that is the spirited part of you, but it's got to have courage. Otherwise, it won't be capable of doing anything on your own behalf or on the behalf of other people. So you've got to nurture the spirited part by trying to build up good courage. And then the third part is uh, your rational element. Of course, that's got to have wisdom. The part of you that makes decisions, that exercises foresight, and that is judging questions should be wise, right? Wise, judicious, intelligent, and so forth. Now, when each of the three of your parts of the soul have the virtue that's relevant to them, and when they are each doing their own work and not trying to interfere with the operation of the other parts, like for example, don't allow your spirited nature to dominate your behavior and become the leader of your life. Don't allow your appetites to overthrow your better judgment and to lead you into unwise behavior. Allow reason to rule within you. Allow the intelligence and wisdom within you to take the driver's seat and be the captain of your soul. Allow the other parts to do their own prescribed job, but not to become larger and more powerful than what they should be. These lower parts of the soul are supposed to be willfully submissive to the rational part. They're supposed to defer to it, to bow to your reason. So what's bad for you is when the parts of the soul war with each other, when they compete with each other, and when they struggle for control. Then they're not cooperating. Then they're not peacefully submissive to the reason that is within you. And that's when your life might not go well. So what's a life well lived? One in which each part of your soul operates based on its virtue, when it does not step outside of its lane and does its own job, but not the jobs of other parts. And when everybody's on the same page, that the rational element inside of you should be uh, allowed to rule. Let me read then from Plato, and you can see how he puts the point in his own way. So, okay, in this dialogue, as many of the Platonic writings, it's Socrates who's talking, and he's having a conversation, actually, in this case, with Glaucon, who's Plato's older brother. So it's like Plato's older brother and Socrates having this discussion. So Socrates says, and this is right at the beginning, on 743. Well then, we've now made our difficult way through a sea of argument. We're pretty much agreed that the same number and the same kinds of classes as are in the city are also in the soul of each individual. And um, Glaucon says that's true. Socrates says, therefore, it necessarily follows that the individual is wise in the same way and in the same part of himself as the city. Glaucon says that's right. Socrates continues, he says, and isn't the individual courageous in the same way and in the same part of himself as the city? And isn't everything else that has to do with virtue the same in both? He says, necessarily, Socrates. Okay, moreover, Glaucon, I suppose we'll say that a man is just in the same way as a city. That too is true. And we surely haven't forgotten that the city was just because each of the three classes in it was doing its own work. He says, I don't think we could forget that. He says, then we must also remember that each one of us in whom each part is doing its own work will himself be just and do his own. He says, of course we must. So he continues, therefore, isn't it appropriate for the rational part to rule since it is really wise and exercises foresight on behalf of the whole soul and for the spirited part to obey it and be its ally? And Glaucon says, yes, it is true. And he says, now talking about the educational process, isn't it a mixture of music and poetry on the one hand and physical training on the other that makes the two parts harmonious, stretching and nurturing the rational part with fine words and learning, relaxing the other part through soothing stories and making it gentle by means of harmony and rhythm? Precisely. And these two, having been nurtured in this way and having truly learned their role and been educated in them, will govern the appetitive part. So what he's saying is sometimes these two are going to have to work together to curb the appetitive part which is the largest part in each person's soul and is by nature most insatiable uh, for money, the appetitive part. The other two will watch over it to see that it is not filled with the so-called pleasures of the body and that it does not become so big and strong that it no longer does its own work, but attempts to enslave and rule over the other classes that it's not fit to rule, thereby ruining everyone's life. He says, yes, that's right. Then wouldn't these two parts also do the finest job of guarding the whole soul and body against external enemies? Reason by planning spirit by fighting, and carrying out the leader's decisions through courage. <clears throat> he says, yes, that's true. And it is because of the spirited part, I suppose, that we call the single individual courageous, namely when it perseveres, uh, preserves through pain and pleasure the declarations of reason about what is to be feared and what's not. And we will call him wise because of that small part of himself that rules within him and makes those decisions 
and has within it the knowledge of what is best for each part and for the whole soul, which is the community of all three parts. And isn't he moderate because of the friendly and harmonious relations between the parts, namely, when the ruler and the ruled believe together that the rational part should rule and they do not engage in civil war against it. And he says moderation is nothing other than that, both in the city and in the individual. Um, so what is a just society? One that exhibits this type of harmony and balance among the various parts. What is therefore an ideal human life? Something that's parallel to that, an individual life in which the soul is ordered and harmonized such that the rational part is allowed to rule, the lower parts don't challenge that rule, but each part does do its job in accordance with the virtue that is related to it. Now, he says after that, that good and noble and just behavior comes from having the right type of balance that he's describing here within your soul. But bad, wicked, vicious, and uh, unjust behavior is what happens when the soul is not balanced in this way. So let me um, see if you can think of the answer to my questions here. Suppose that like, for example, a person committed theft, right? They, they, they're a thief, they stole things that did not belong to them. Now, if that's what somebody did, which of the parts of their soul do you think in that case would be getting a little bit out of control and too powerful to commit theft which of these different elements of the soul has become overactive and needs to be reprimanded or somehow controlled? When theft is done, the unjust action of theft, that comes from the appetitive part, right, Sean? That comes from the appetitive part exerting more control and influence over your behavior than it should, right? It's your appetite telling you, just take it and you can have it. It's not your better judgment, right? It's not your wisdom. You know that it's not wise to steal, but sometimes your appetites overwhelm your better judgment and they cause you to do something wrong. So if your reason was actually running everything and if your appetites were temperate, then you wouldn't have done that. So bad behavior like, for example, theft comes from the improper type of imbalance uh, among the parts of the soul. How about another case? Someone cut you off on the road. Um, and you get upset and you get hostile. Instead of just letting it go, you're full of rage. So you follow this person, tailgate them, eventually when they pull over, you pull up next to them and you beat them senseless for doing that. Now that's not smart either. That's not wise and it's also unjust. Um, but when a person did that, which part of their soul do you think has gotten a little too um, powerful and has dominated their behavior, the act of assault rather than theft because of a perceived slight due to road rage, the spirited part, right? So your passions and pride are so powerful that you cannot endure the slight indignity of having been disrespected on the roadways. Now, if you were asked later, was that smart? You know, you would say, no, I did it in the heat of the moment. My passionate emotions got the best of me. And if I had had a while to cool down and think it over rationally, I would have judged that that's not the best thing and I shouldn't do it. You know, so people who are brought into court having done bad things, they always give explanations of these kinds. They'll be like, uh, you know, I was desperate. I felt like I needed something so bad that I couldn't control my better judgment. Or emotionally, uh, I was completely uh, enraged, and therefore I couldn't think straight or think rationally. Now, that's what he says. He says bad behavior proceeds from the wrong type of uh, balance among these parts, where the lower parts have too much power, and they're not deferring to the counsel of your reason. So here's what he said. He said, hmm, do you think that someone similar in nature and training to the city would embezzle a deposit of gold? Who do you think would consider that person to have done it rather than someone that's not like them? He says no one. So basically nobody would think that a just and well-ordered soul would commit theft, only a person whose soul does not exhibit the proper balance. And would he have anything to do with robbery, theft, betrayal of friends in private life or of cities in public life? No, nothing. So with that type of harmonious soul in which reason rules, you would never think and never would it happen that such a person would commit any of these unjust actions. Adultery, disrespect, 
for parents, neglect of the gods, uh, would be more in keeping with every other kind of character than his. And he would be in no way untrustworthy in keeping an oath or agreement. So when you've achieved the proper harmony of the soul, it's kind of like the key that unlocks all the virtuous and noble behavior that people are um, awarded praise for. And when you don't have that type of balance, that's what leads to all the bad behavior that people are condemned and criticized for. Now, after that, another question is put on the table by Plato here. The question is this, what if you could commit unjust behavior but never ever get caught? Would it benefit you? Does a person benefit from unjust behavior as long as nobody finds out about it, as long as nobody knows about it? What do you think? Do you think that um, wicked, unjust behavior could be a benefit to a person as long as nobody finds out? Like, you know, say a person was gonna cheat on a paper and they did it and they never got caught. Could that benefit them? Or a person steals an item from somebody, nobody ever found out about it. Could that be to their benefit? Shauna, you're saying no, and you're on the right same page with Plato because Plato slash Socrates, they say, no, you cannot benefit from unjust behavior. It doesn't matter if nobody knows about it. Even if nobody ever, ever finds out about unjust behavior and you go free of uh, any detection, it does not benefit you. Now, Sherry, you say it depends on their morals. Well, not to Plato, no, it doesn't, because you're objectively harmed. It's not a matter of do you subjectively feel bad or not. You're harmed, whether you know it or not. So, no, you cannot benefit from unjust behavior. And let me explain to you why. So, <clears throat> at least according to the Greek thought. <clears throat> So here's the question. Question. Does unjust uh, behavior benefit you? As long as nobody knows about it. And, you know, answer from Plato and Socrates, no. Um, <clears throat> so there's a myth, actually, that uh, is referred to in other of these ancient writings. So an ancient Greek myth that existed way back was this claim or idea of the ring of Gyges. So this mythical ring is just a legend, but according to the myth, if you had found it and you put it on your ring, if you put the ring on your finger, uh, it would make you invisible at that time. So it would cloak you in invisibility. And imagine that you found the ring of Gyges, right? You'd be totally tempted to do all kinds of things that you probably shouldn't do, like steal from people or uh, have access to places where um, you're not authorized to be or to eavesdrop or anything else. So an invisible person cannot be caught committing theft or trespassing or something because there's no visibility to see. Now, a way of thinking about the question is like that, you know, if you could get away with anything and no one would ever know, would that be to your advantage to do those things? Well, Socrates slash Plato, they say, no, you cannot benefit from it. And it doesn't matter. It's not just about people finding out. That's not the disadvantage, the only disadvantage that comes from bad behavior. There is a harm that you do to yourself through unjust actions. You basically, he thinks, corrupt your soul inside. And when you do that, you are harmed and you are worse off. Even if nobody in the whole world knows about it, you're suffering because your soul has been damaged inside. So um, let me show you what he means by that. He gives a metaphor to explain his thinking here. Now it's a kind of out there hypothesis or I should say hypothetical scenario, but it's a situation where we're told to uh, think about a three-headed creature. Okay, so let me give you this example three-headed creature. Okay, so here we go. Um, I'm gonna, you see these notes, right? That I'm about to detail the three-headed creature. I want a little more room, so I'm gonna kind of erase this. <clears throat> now, the one head 
it's not exactly 100% accurate to call it just one head because it's described as like a section of a bunch of little snapping like gargoyle heads. So that's the one over here. And in it, there's a bunch of these little guys. So these little heads that are in the one section, they're like little hungry beasts, like little gargoyle type things that want to eat. They're just like, feed me, feed me, now, now, now. That's all that they're about. That head. Okay, so that's one of the three. Over here, the, uh, the second one I'll talk about is the lion's head. So, I mean, no, I have a cat. I probably should be a little bit better at drawing a feline type animal. But that's the best for getting it. So, lion head, second one. Okay, now the third is just a human, a normal human head. So that's this one. Okay, so we got a three-headed creature here. Now, the whole reason he's bringing this up is because each of the heads is supposed to stand for a different part of the human soul. So let's see if you can make a connection of which ones stand for what. All the little snapping gargoyle heads over here that are, like, hungry, that need to eat, that want to eat, what do you think is the part of the soul that they stand for in this metaphor, in this analogy? Gargoyle section represents what? Which part of the soul? Hmm. Correct, the appetitive part. And that is because they have, they just, they're pure appetite. They're just looking for the satisfaction of the appetite. Over here, the noble lion, the proud lion, you know, the king of the jungle and all of that. What do you think that supposed to signify here out of the three parts so you it's not the appetitive because we've covered that so it's one of the other two which one do you think the line represents good the spirited part <clears throat> lions are proud you know traveling a pride so that's kind of like the spirited aspect of you now the human head clearly that's what that's the third that's the rational part because a human being is a more rational kind of uh, life form than a non-human lion or a bunch of little beastly gargoyles. So I want you next to imagine this, that although there are these three heads that this creature has got, that when everybody else looks at the creature, like outside people looking in on them, they only see one of the three heads. And which one do you think that everybody else sees when they look? They just see this one. To outside observers looking on to this person, they merely see, which do you think of the three? There's only one that outside people see. They can't see what's going on inside. It just looks like to them that there's only which one. What could that be? The head seen by others is simply, yes, the human one. Right, so to an outside perspective, to everyone else, to all appearances, this just looks like a normal human being. Hey, how are you? Like, like looking at one of us, you see the human face. But now Plato says, imagine that this is what's going on behind the scenes, what others cannot see. What's going on behind the scenes is that these gargoyles, they're snapping at the human head and like almost getting close to biting it. So they're like lunging at him, ah, nah, nah, biting and stuff, right? And he's scared from that. He doesn't want to get bitten and attacked. So he's kind of like recoiling in fear and terror away from them. But as he's doing that, the lion over here is lunging at him from the opposite direction and like trying to bite him up from the other head, uh, from the other direction, the other side. So now it's like this human being is actually being enslaved and dominated inside by these other parts that are not at all fit to run things. So he says that's actually what happens when you engage in bad and unjust behavior, even if nobody knows about it. What's happening on the inside to you is something bad for you. You're putting the parts of your soul at war with each other, and you're making too strong and too powerful the inferior parts of your soul that should not be leading your life. So what ends up happening to you over time is that the human voice within you, your reason, it starts getting dragged along wherever the other two parts wants to lead it. And now the best and most godly part of you has been enslaved and dominated and suppressed. 
and therefore the most human element within you is losing its voice and it's merely being subjected to the whims and passions of the non-rational inferior parts of your soul. So you're getting enslaved in a way by doing this. Why would you do that to yourself? You're hurting yourself then by doing that, even if nobody knows. So to all appearances, it's just a human head and just a human person. They can't see this drama playing out behind the scenes. But when you engage in bad behavior, there's a cost that you pay, which you impose on yourself. It is the cost in terms of the corruption and damage to your soul. So I'll read you his words and you can see what he says. Um, <clears throat> so the question was made. <clears throat> Socrates says, I think someone said at one point that injustice profits a completely unjust person who is believed to be just. Isn't that so? Glaucon says, certainly. Socrates says, well, then let's discuss this with him since we've now agreed on the power that injustice and justice have. Glaucon asks, how? Socrates says, by fashioning an image of the soul in words so that the person who says this sort of thing will know what he is saying. Glaucon asks, what sort of image, Socrates? And he says, okay, one like those creatures that legends tell us used to exist in the ancient times, such as the Chimera or the Cerberus or any of a multitude of others in which many different kinds of things are said to have grown together naturally into one. <coughs> the legends tell us of such things. So, <coughs> sorry. Fashion a single kind of multicolored beast with a ring of many heads that it can grow and change at will some from gentle, some from savage animals. And Glaucon says, that's work for a clever artist. However, since words are more flexible than wax, consider it done. He says, then, okay, then fashion one other kind, that of a lion, and another of a human being. But make the first much the largest, and the other second to it in size. And he says, easy, sculpting is done. So he says, now join the three of them into one so that they somehow grow together naturally. Okay. Then fashion around the image of one of them, that of a human being, so that anyone who sees only the out, outer covering and not what's inside will think it is a single creature, a human being. And he says, okay, done. Now, here's the key quote. He says, if somebody tells you that injustice profits this human being and that doing just things brings no advantage, let's tell him that he is simply saying that it is beneficial for him first to feed the multiform beast and make it strong, and also the lion and all that pertains to him, second, to starve and weaken the human being within so that he is dragged along wherever either of the other two leads, and third, to leave the parts to bite and kill one another rather than teaching them to, accustoming them to each other and making them friendly. He says that is what someone who praises injustice is saying. But on the other hand, wouldn't someone who maintains that just things are profitable be saying first that all our words and deeds should ensure that the human being within the human has the most control. Second, that he should take care of the many-headed beasts as a farmer does his animals, feeding and domesticating the gentle heads and preventing the savage ones from growing. And third, that he should make the lion's nature his ally, care for the community of all the parts, and bring them up in such a way that they'll be friends with each other and with himself. That's exactly what someone who praises justice is saying. So... The cost of unjust behavior is placing the parts of your soul in competition and at war with each other so that they will not listen to the rational leadership of your reason. Um, and even if nobody knows about it or ever discovers it, you now have to live an, in a state of internal conflict and turmoil where the parts of your soul don't agree. It's like you have appetites that your better judgment is telling you you should not act on and you have passions and pride and emotions that your reason is telling you should not govern your behavior, and yet you have no control over them because you've allowed the reason to become that weak. That's what unjust behavior does to you, and so you're killing yourself with that stuff. You're hurting yourself with that stuff. Don't be fooled into thinking that unjust behavior is somehow a benefit to the person who escapes without getting caught because it's not the harm that comes from getting caught. It's the harm that's done to your soul on the inside, even when nobody knows about it. So the next quote that I'm going to read you is a quote that I really like from his writing here, where he says that if there's people out there that are telling you, just do all this bad stuff, cheat, lie, steal, and if you can get away with it, you'll be better off. Don't worry about all those high-minded goody-goodies that are telling you don't do those things. You're going to be more advantaged if you do. He says people saying that don't know what they're talking about, 
and they actually don't have your best interests in mind because what they're telling you to do is to corrupt your soul and to pollute and destroy your soul. And that's the most precious thing that you have to take care of. Who can corrupt your soul? Think about my question. Who could do that? Not me, not anybody, just you. I can't walk up to a person and say, hey, you buddy, I just corrupted your soul. What do you think about that? That makes no sense, right? You have to take actions which undermine your own integrity and your own uh, rationality to corrupt your own being. So it's a kind of harm that you could only do to yourself. It's a self-harm. And it's one of the, the biggest ones that could ever happen. So he's telling you again, don't follow the counsel or guidance of people who are telling you to destroy your soul by being unjust. They may think that there's no disadvantage to it or that, in fact, it benefits you. But nothing could be further from the truth. These people want you to ruin your life. So don't follow them. And I'll read you what he says. <clears throat> he says, from every point of view, anybody that praises, praises justice speaks the truth. And anybody who praises injustice is speaking false. Whether we look at the situation from the point of view of pleasure, good reputation, or advantage, a praiser of justice is telling the truth, and one who condemns it has nothing good to say and does not know what they're talking about. So, you know, that's his way of looking at it in the end. Um, you should try to establish the, the type of harmony and order among the parts of your soul that he's gone at length to describe. And if you don't do so, you know, um, you're going to be bad. You're going to be in a worse off position, you know. So the only thing that he can say is try to follow this pattern, try and follow this path to being uh, a person with a virtuous soul. And if you don't, um, you'll pay a price and you'll find out. So <clears throat> another example mentioned right afterwards is this. What if you could trade a loved one to people that wanted to torture them Evil people, right? They, they want to, like, torture and abuse a dear loved one, like a child of yours, a parent, maybe a loved one, like a friend or sibling. And they're willing to give you as much gold as you want. So they tell you, how much? Name your price. Any amount of money. All I want is to take your loved one so that I can do whatever I want to them. Now, if you engaged in this interaction, this transaction, you accepted the gold in exchange for selling out your loved one. Would you be better off? Would you have profited from that exchange? You could argue financially in some superficial sense, yes. But would you be better off in terms of the internal constitution of your soul? Clearly not. And so that's kind of what you do when you engage in uh, unjust behavior in the hopes that you're going to benefit from it. You're selling out your uh, rational part in exchange for the perceived golden gifts that you might receive instead. Um, so it's just as much bad and unhealthy as if you had traded a loved one to those that want to enslave and torture them. He says this, in light of this argument, can it profit anyone to acquire gold unjustly if by doing so he enslaves the best part of himself to the most vicious? If you got gold by enslaving your son or daughter to savage and evil men, it would not profit you no matter how much gold that you got. So how could you fail to be wretched? If you pitilessly enslave the most divine part of yourself to the most godless and polluted part and accept golden gifts in return for a more terrible destruction. So that's kind of how he rests his case in the end. Um, sometimes in a household, there's a child in the household. And like if a door-to-door -door salesman came and was like, excuse me, I have something to uh, sell you guys. Is your mom or dad home? Is the head of the household there? If the child said, they're here, but... We have a weird household where they've asked me to just be the leader. Is that a well-run household where the child is making all the decisions financially and otherwise for the whole family? Of course not. Why would you not want a child like a six-year-old running your life today? Because they don't have the, the wisdom or the rationality to make good and careful decisions. Um, a child, you know, if you tell them, hey, you can do whatever you want, they're never going to go to school. They're never going to eat a healthy meal. Um, so reason has to rule. If you just allow the immature appetites and passions that you have to dominate your life, you're bound to be just as poorly organized and just as disadvantaged as this example of a household run by a small child. That would be like letting your appetites rule your life. But you have reason there. That's like the adult in the room. So let that part of you dictate your life, um, and you'll be better off. It's for your benefit that you would do that. At least this is what the Greek thought was. Okay, so, so much for Plato.
Now <clears throat> we have to take a look at a different paradigm, a different account. So that's the work of Jean-Paul Sartre. Sherry, what you say is, when I read Plato or any of the ancients, I have a hard time understanding the reading, drawing the right conclusion. Is there a book on or about the Republic that you can recommend? Um, well, there's a lot of uh, contemporary readers. Like, you could read um, from Oxford or Cambridge Press um, an academic companion to the Republic. So that would be a good starting place. I think that Oxford is like the leader in um, philosophical publishing worldwide for Western philosophy. Um, and even though I'm not like looking at any such uh, info right now, I I'm 100% sure that they have a whole range of companions and readers that assist the person in looking at the, the Greek writings of the Republic. Now, you should also just read the Republic too. It's one of those books which sinks in over time as you read through it. The thing about philosophy is um, sometimes you just got to be willing to keep going. Uh, if you if you get bogged down on like one paragraph and you're like, I can't move on until I understand every piece of this one paragraph, then you might not get to see the larger argument, which would have come into better focus if you had just kept going. At least that's me. So I like to just try and get through it, read through it one time, even if the comprehension's not totally setting in. And then it starts to come into focus as more and more of the material gets digested. So that's one reading strategy. Other than that, I would say go to Oxford University Press or Cambridge Press and look for um, a companion to Plato's Republic. They both have those. Okay, so good. Then next up, Jean-Paul Sartre. So this is a French philosopher of the 20th century. He lived from 1905 to 1980. And um, <clears throat> there's this uh, lecture that he delivered in 1945, which has been published in this book. And it's just called Existentialism. Existentialism. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Sherry, for your question, too. Um, <clears throat> So we're looking at and we're comparing different views uh, about what would make a human life go well. You've heard the Greek account from Plato just now. Now we're fast forwarding like 2,000 years in time ahead to relatively recent times, uh, the 20th century and Sartre existentialism. This man is a French philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre is his name. Uh, the French pronunciation of the name Sartre, you know, with that soft R, it's a little hard for the American tongue to pronounce, but not too big a deal, Jean-Paul Sartre. So he is a man who's well known for establishing a method and a system in philosophy called existentialism. Um, and this is definitely a much more postmodern idea about, about life and about value and about what makes a life go well. So a major difference between Plato's view and Sartre's view when it comes to what makes a life go well is that Plato said everybody should pretty much be trying to get to the same result. Everybody should try and empower their reason, allow that to preside over the lower parts of their soul, all of them cooperate and do their job according to the virtue. He didn't say some people should just focus on their appetites. Some people should just focus on their passions and only some people should be reasonable. I mean, yes, people should be divided into various categories of society, but on an individual level, you should still be trying to appoint reason to the highest position. Um, so it's like a one-size-fits-all universal account of what makes life go well. For Sartre, though, it's way more radically subjective. In his mind, there's no universal method or approach to living the best human life. It just depends on the individual and what it is that they themselves value or determine to be the best life. So we're going to see, like, from the point of view of Plato, it was very objective and universalist. In this case, it's much more subjective and um, individual. So a different account. Um, <clears throat> sure got the book here. Yeah. Okay, so Sartre. Uh, and the system or the idea of existentialism is quite complex. You could take a whole semester on this topic. You could read a whole raft of literature on existentialist thought 
So what I'm going to do, as usual, is just try to give you the basics, uh, the key details about existentialism. And if you are ever interested in like learning more, um, you definitely there's a lot of literature out there that you could review. Okay, so what's the first big idea of existentialism? There's a slogan or a phrase which is considered to be the core of the existentialist philosophy. It's this statement, that existence precedes essence. Okay, so this is like all important. This statement is key to understand existentialism. Existence precedes essence. They believe this, and they reject the opposite statement. So I'm going to write the opposite statement, but I'm going to cross it all out so that everyone knows that's something they reject. They reject this view, that essence precedes existence. No, it doesn't. It's the other way around, so they say. No, no to this, yes to that. Existence precedes essence, not the other way around. So let's try and get clear about what this statement actually means then. Tell me, what is it for something to precede something else? Yeah, what's that? If, if A precedes B, what's the relation of those two things? To precede something is definition to what? Precede. What is that? Yes, to come before it, exactly. So uh, this meeting right here precedes the final. And um, New Year's of this year, that preceded the beginning of this semester. You know, uh, The election of uh, Donald Trump preceded the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, the presidency of Obama preceded the presidency of Trump. Just giving you a bunch of different illustrations of how this word would be used in a sentence. So to precede something is, yeah, it's just to come before it. Therefore, what this says is, for a human being, the order that things go in is that first you exist, and later on after that, you acquire an essence. You don't have the essence at first, later that happens. So next question is, what does the word essence refer to? Okay. Um, all right, now the word essence is, um, yeah, that's the point, right? We're going to do that now. But actually, I was going to, uh, I was going to hold you in suspense, though, for just a minute, actually. So question, what do you think is the word essence mean? Um, if I ask you what's the essence of something, what do you think is the question that I'm asking? What, in other words, if anything, does your mind think of when you're hearing this word essence? I'm just curious. It's a, it's a word. Is it in your vocabulary? What does it mean to you? The essence of something. We'll just see if you have a thought on that. Because I like to see if there's anything there and then I can use that as leverage. What makes it stand out? Okay, sort of. Um, I like the first three words of that, what makes it. Um, yeah, okay, good also. Good uh, additional comment, Gilberto. It, what makes it unique? It's basically what makes it what it is. It is the set of necessary defining characteristic traits that it has, okay? So let me put that here, and then I'll, we'll talk more about examples. <clears throat> I say traits. I don't want you to think that I'm talking about, like, appearance or something. Traits in the more general sense of like attributes or whatever. Um, so maybe I'll just put that here, just so it's clear enough. 
sorry to change the, the word there, but it's, it's a subtle distinction. It's both would be fine, but I, to avoid possible confusion, I'm going to use the term attribute instead. Okay, so what is the essence of something? It are, they are the necessary defining attributes of that thing. They're the attributes, the features that are required for it to be the thing that it is. So they're the essential features of something. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> question. Now that I've given you this definition, what would you say is the essence of a square? What is the essence of the geometric figure, which we call the square? Tell me what's essential to being a square. What do you? What qualities do you have to have? You have to have to have it to be a square. You gotta have four sides. Good. Uh, that's definitely part of the essence. But there's also rectangles. So we could say a little more. The square must have four sides, true enough. But there's a little more that can be said to perfectly specify the essential defining traits of that, of that object. So four sides is necessary, yes. Four equal sides, that's good. But keep in mind that there can be a diamond shape where all four sides are of equal length. So there's one more little small thing. Taking you back to geometry. Sorry to do that, but what's the last thing about a square? Four sides, equal length, so it's not a rectangle. It's a square. They've got equal length sides. But we've got to make sure to mention one more thing about the basically like the angles that are inside. You know, because like this. That could be four equal length sides too. The sort of rhombus. So what's the last thing? 90 degree interior angles, correct. I'm not going to put that stuff about the square on the board because this is not a math class or geometry class. But basically, I'm just using it as an example of essence. Yeah. So the essence of squares, what every single square has, is four sides, equal length, and the interior angles are each 90 degrees, right angles. Okay. Now, some squares are bigger in overall, um, like, size, uh, but they're all essentially going to have the three features mentioned here. Now, is the color blue part of the essence of the square? No. Okay, we talked, I believe, about something concerning essential properties when we talked about the wax example a few weeks before. So anyway, that's the essence of the square. Now, according to existentialist thought, the more interesting thing to talk about is not just the essence of abstract objects like squares or circles or anything, but that even we do have essences. We humans, us human beings, we each have got an essence too. Except when we talk about the essence that I have or that you have, we're not talking about the sides on a polygon, but we're talking about the attributes that make you the unique person that you are. Okay, so the essence of you is like the things that you would say to a person if they asked, tell me about yourself. Like, what kind of person are you? Who are you? Suppose they don't know the first thing about you, right? And now you're going to try and give them a sense of who you essentially are, right? So you would start telling them certain very fundamental facts that express your essence to that person. Well, what kind of things do you think you would say if you're going to, re you know, um, give an account of your essence to a person, like your essential defining at, uh, characteristic traits? And please don't just let's not talk about physical appearance. This is really not what's being discussed. It has to do with like the kind of person that you are. So you might, in revealing your essence to a person, tell them what facts about yourself, what information might you give to give them a sense of your essential person. You could tell them like what things. Like what is your essence? What are the really fundamental facts that make uh, you the unique person that's a little different from me or from the other people in your life or anybody else you've ever met, what are those kinds of attributes? There's a whole bundle of them, so let's just talk about a few. The kind of stuff that is considered by a person to be constitutive of their whole ident identity. Things like what? Okay, what you do for a living. Right, yeah, so that's one possible thing. You could talk about what you do for a job, what is your profession, but we're just scratching the surface, so let's keep going. Uh, now, Goberto, you say sticks to routine. Uh, I don't want it to be as specific as that, though. I'm talking about the, the category of something that you would mention to a person, not Goberto specifically, but one. What would one say in an effort to provide facts about their essence? 
once again, though, Shauna, it's a little too specific. I don't want the quality. I want like, okay, like, <clears throat> does this person hold interests, talents, hobbies? Gilberto, again, you're doing this thing again. You're saying humorous, kind. That's too specific. Because when I'm talking about the concept of any arbitrarily selected human, what they might say about themselves. So you could say, what is your major? What uh, is, do you believe in God and what religion? Uh, what are activities that you find to be the most enjoyable? What is your favorite food? What is your taste in music? Um, what is your taste in fashion? What are your political views? Um, and stuff like that, right? So, but look, Shauna and Gilberto, when you say athletic, humorous, kind, that could be one person's essence. But what kind of things would be mentioned in anybody's attempt to give a, a statement of their essence would be like political philosophy, religious affiliation, um, temperament. Um, notice that when I say temperament, I'm not saying what kind of temperament, angry, laid back. It's just the stuff that you would talk about, right? Okay, good. Now you understand me. Um, so yeah, if I was going to tell you about my essence, now let's go into a specific individual case, right? You start with the general and then you move to the particular. So me, for example, someone's like, hey, what are you all about? Tell me about yourself. I'll be like, okay, I'll tell you. I'm a, I'm a philosopher, so I'm an academic. Uh, I'm a musician person, so I love music. That's very important to me. That's part of my personality, my identity. I'm an animal lover, you know, so I have a pet cat. Um, uh, politically, uh, maybe a little bit center left. Um, in terms of religion, I've got an open mind, but I'm kind of an agnostic. Um, yeah, and so Maria, what are you saying? Less of the characteristics and more like your individuality in terms of mind and action. Well, when you give your essence, you will give characteristics, but I don't know what you mean by characteristics, I guess. Like, uh, like character traits could be part of it. Um, if I'm a person who's easily annoyed instead of being very patient, I could say that's part of my essence too. Everybody knows that I just, you know, I have no patience. Everybody knows about me that um, I'm a thrill seeker. No, I'm very risk averse, you know. So whatever each individual person's essence is like, it's the set of factors, the qualities, the descriptive traits that reveal to a person what kind of individual you are. Like on social media accounts and dating websites, sometimes people try and say a little thing about themselves, writing a little bio, you know. Oh, I love long walks and I'm a moviegoer. Um, you know, I, I, I hate traffic. You know, people say things about themselves that reveal their individual unique personality. They don't just be like person, <laughs> you know. You gotta say something that gives a sense of your uniqueness. So, okay, hopefully now we've clarified one thing, that existentialists believe that existence comes before essence. And the word essence means the necessary defining traits of something. Now, with me and you, the idea is, first, when we're born, we're a blank slate. We don't have an essence yet. A baby born today, is this baby a liberal? Is it a conservative? Is it a religious atheist? Is it, um, is it introverted, extroverted? Is it a person that um, is a more math person or a more literature person? Is this a movie-going person or a more book person? We don't know, and there's no answer, right? Because on day one, there's no essence there. It's just a clean slate, and it can develop in any way possible. But that essence will take shape over time, and it comes into being later. So then, if when you're born and you start this life, you don't have an essence, but then at today, at, for example, as an adult that you are, you do have an essence, where do you think it comes from? If it wasn't there at the beginning because Sartre and the existentialists <clears throat> they definitely have a clear opinion on where that essence is coming from so where do you think it's uh, claimed to be coming from at least according to these thoughts where'd your essence come from it wasn't there at the beginning so what created it I wonder okay good Sherry now your answer I like that because let me just tell you, like in 90% of the case where I asked this question during this lecture, uh, the number one answer that a student gives is uh, the way I was raised or my experiences or something. And that's actually not what existentialists believe. They think more like what you're saying, that it comes from you. 
It comes from your own free choices. So you're the one who's made decisions to shape your essence in the way that it has gone. So you're totally in control of it. You're in the driver's seat. You have free will according to these existentialists. And therefore you use your free will to determine the way that the essence plays out. Okay, so I'm gonna put the idea here. Um, we create our own essence. with our free will and choices. So it's very important to Sartre's thinking to reject the claim that your essence is somehow given to you from external factors that you don't have control over. In fact, there's a word that he uses to um, to attack that exact idea. And the term that he uses is the term which he calls bad faith. So bad faith in the existentialist uh, vocabulary is just any situation where you try to place responsibility for your essence on external things that you don't have control over. So. Okay, so <clears throat> the essence comes from you. You're the author of the essence that you have. So if you're wondering when you're sitting there, why am I like this? Look in the mirror. That's what the existentialist tells you. You're the reason that you're like that. You know, so why am I the outgoing life of the party? Or why am I the introverted uh, bookworm? Why am I the big political conservative? No, the super left liberal why am I this devout religious person? Why am I this skeptic or this atheist? Whichever case is yours, the reason, the answer to that question is because you chose to be that way. Because you have free will and you decided to shape your essence in that particular pattern and, and way. Now, what would be bad faith? Bad faith would be giving this kind of answer. Well, I'm like that because my parents raised me that way. Or I'm like that because of the place or the time that I grew up. Trying to blame or cast responsibility for your essence on external factors that you cannot control is bad faith. Bad faith meaning you know in your heart of hearts deep down that that is not true and that your essence is actually completely due to you. Um, so that's the essential argument of existentialism that uh, existence precedes essence and through our free will we create our own essence. So since it's yours and since you create it, and since you're free to create it however you want, he says that you have to take total responsibility for it too. Um, you should not exhibit bad faith. You should affirm and embrace the individual, individualism that you've created for yourself. Don't live a life where you try and um, avoid the personal responsibility for the type of essence that you have. Um, since you're free, you can make it be whatever you want but you have to basically live with the results and you shouldn't try and blame the way you have turned out on anybody or anything else. So I'll read this to you in his words. He says on page 749, <clears throat> man is nothing else but what he makes of himself. And I'm gonna add one thing before I continue reading. He says that because me and you have this free will to shape our essence, we're special because only human beings can do that. Take like a common animal, a lower animal that's not human. Um, like a cow, right? The cow that's born today is going to live the same pattern of life that every cow has ever lived in every generation. It's not like that cow today will someday think, what kind of cow am I going to be? Am I going to be an artist or a business cow? Am I going to be, you know, um, aggressive or gentle? Am I going to be uh, politically liberal or conservative? Should I believe in God or not? Will I be an artist, a carpenter, a professor, 
they don't have those choices and they can't make those choices. They basically are going to live the biological pattern of life, reproduction, and death that every other non-human animal uh, experiences. But a human born today is going to have unlimited options in terms of which direction it will take its life. And so we're each of us shaping a life, our own. And that life that you have is totally under your control. More than anything else in this world, you can control your life. So you can shape your essence into whatever direction that you want. And you should feel free. You should not feel somehow constrained by factors that have been imposed upon you from outside. So you shouldn't be thinking, well, a person who grew up in my community, this is how I am because of that. A person with these kind of parents, that's the way they would be because of that. So like a stone or uh, a leaf blowing in the wind, it can't decide, I want to blow in that direction and land over there. No, no, actually, I want to go in the other direction. There's no choices to be made in those cases. So we humans, he says, also have this much greater dignity and worth because we alone can control through our free will our essence. And everything else that exists cannot do that. So let me read that. Man is nothing else but what he makes of himself. Such is the first principle of existentialism. It is also what is called subjectivity, the name that we are labeled with when charges are brought against us. But what do we mean by this, if not that man has a greater dignity than a stone or a table? For we mean that man first exists, that is, that man first of all is the being who hurls himself toward a future and who is conscious of imagining himself as being in the future. Man is at the start a plan which is aware of itself. Rather than a patch of moss, a piece of garbage, or a cauliflower, you know, random stuff, nothing exists prior to this plan. Man will be what he is planned to be. Uh, by the word will, we generally mean a conscious decision, which is subsequent to what we have already made of ourselves. <clears throat> now, I may want to belong to a political party, write a book, get married, but all that is only a manifestation of an earlier choice, which is called will. If existence really does precede essence, man is responsible for what he is. So existentialism's first move is to make every man aware of what he is and to make the full responsibility of his existence rest on him. When we say man is responsible for himself, we do not only mean that he is responsible for his own individuality, but that he is responsible for all men. Okay, now I hope, I'm going to try and explain to you guys that last quote right there, that in, a, in some kind of metaphorical sense, you're responsible for all humanity. Okay. What is being stated there is this point. By creating your own essence... You create a model of how you think all people should live. So that is the reason that he says, it's like a metaphor, but he says, um, by creating yourself, you also create all of humanity. Now, you don't literally create all of humanity, right? You just create one person, you. But the person that you create, yourself, represents your values, okay? It represents the way you think people should live, pretty much. So your own person sort of reflects your personal idea of the ideal human life. So it's an interesting element of existentialism What's the ideal human life then, according to this theory? It's pretty much the life that you're already living. Because if you thought there was a better life that you could live, then you would have made a free will decision to do a different thing. Like, for example, um, if a person came up to me and said to me, I'm thinking about being a philosophy professor. Do you think that I would tell them, what a stupid idea, that's the worst profession ever? Me. Do you think I would say that? What would be my response? Do you think I approve of people becoming philosophy professors in this world or not? What would you say if you had to guess? And why? If someone else wants to be a philosophy professor, am I okay with that? Do I think that's a good choice for life? Sure. But why do you think that I would say so? Why do you think that I'm the last person who's going to say that's the worst way to live? 
I approve of it, obviously, for the reason that what? Because I am a philosopher, so it would make no sense for me to say the choices that I've made to create my own being are choices that I don't endorse when other people do it. Like, for example, suppose that you're a married person. I don't know. People make all kinds of silly, cynical jokes about marriage. So let's go with religion. Uh, suppose you're a member of a religion and someone else is also going to practice that religion. Do you think that you would approve of their practice of the religion or you say stop being that kind of member of this uh, denomination? No. If, if someone practices the same religion of you, as you, of course you approve of what they're doing because they're doing what you've chosen to do. So you're in a position to approve of your own choices. And you would not be capable of saying that they're bad because by choosing them, you already affirmed that you thought they were good. Of course, I think it's a good choice for somebody to be a philosopher because I made that choice. So I would be a hypocrite at best if I said, good for me, bad for you. Okay? So if anybody else out there was going to be like a musician philosopher, uh, I would be like, that's a fine thing. Because I'm not really capable of saying otherwise since those reflect my own values and my own choices. If, if a person wanted to go to Orange Coast College um, and take your major, uh, you would probably not be able to say to them, what a dumb choice in your life, because it's your choice. So you believe in your own choices at least. Therefore, when you create your own person, you're also kind of creating a model of how you think people should live. Like, if everybody lived in the way that I'm living, I would, of course, not criticize them because then I'd be criticizing myself, you see? That's what he says here. So, like, if you marry... You choose marriage for yourself, but you also show that you believe that if anybody else chose to get married, that they made a choice that you believe in, right? You validate the approval of something by doing it yourself. Um, so it says here, <clears throat> subjectivism means on the one hand that an individual chooses and makes himself, and on the other that it is impossible for man to transcend human subjectivity. The second of these is the essential meaning of existentialism. When we say that man chooses his own self, we mean that every one of us does likewise, but we also mean that by this, by that, in making this choice, he chooses all men. In fact, in creating the man that we want to be, there is not a single one of our actions which does not at the same time create an image of man as we think he ought to be. To choose to be this or that is to affirm at the same time the value of what we choose. Because we can never choose what we think is bad from our own point of view. We always choose the good. And nothing can be good for me without being good for all. So people out there studying philosophy, I'm not the one who's going to say, that's a dumb major. Maybe someone else might say that who doesn't study it because they have a different point of view than me. But people who do the things that I've done are doing things that I believe in. That's why I did them. So he says here, if on the other hand existence precedes essence and we grant that we exist and fashion our image, at one and the same time, the image is valid for everybody and for our whole age. Thus, our responsibility is much greater than we might have supposed, because it involves all mankind. If I am a working man and choose to join a Christian trade union instead of becoming a communist, then I am choosing this for all mankind. I'm not only involving my own case. I want all to do as, as the same. As a result, my action has involved all humanity. To take a more individual matter... If I want to marry, to have children, even if this marriage depends solely on my own circumstances or wishes, I am involving all humanity in monogamy and not merely myself. So like if you choose the path of marriage and monogamy, of course you don't look at other people doing the same and say, what a bad choice of life, because they're choosing the same things in life as you. So remember Plato said, um, if you want to lead, lead the best life, you know, get your reason to be the most powerful within you, allow the different parts of your soul to cooperate and work under the guidance of the reason and according to their virtue. But for, for, Sartre, for Sartre, it's much more radically individualistic. Each one of us is already living in the spirit of what we think is the best life because our choices reflect our values and priorities. So, you know, if I choose uh, to be the political liberal, then other people who feel the same way, we have an alignment of values. And I believe that they're good and that they're doing the right thing because they're doing the same thing as me. So in this view of life, there's no one and only dominant conception of the right way to live. Each one of us creates our own essence. Each one of us, by creating that essence, is putting forward our example to the world. Will other people follow the example? Maybe, maybe not. But if they do, we accept that and we like it because 
they're doing something that reflects what we already consider to be good choices in life. Now, um, <clears throat> there's sort of a dark side though to this. The bright side is if existentialism is true, then you're absolutely free. And you should feel like I can be whatever I want to be and there's no limits on my freedom. If I want to choose to be any type of person, I could do that starting now, or maybe I've already done so. Um, it means that you're liberated from the contingencies of the external world around you. Like um, some people will say, look, I, I grew up in a super religious household, so it wasn't really my choice. But even that isn't true. Are there people who grow up in that same kind of household that rebel against their parents and others that uh, follow the example of their parents? Sure. Which kind of person will you be? Well, it's your choice. Um, whether you believe in God is your choice. Whether you choose to rebel or follow uh, is certainly your choice. So you can't say that under any set of circumstances that you didn't have the freedom to make your own determinations. So your essence is yours. It's yours to create. There's no objective answer, though, as to which one is the best. All that can be said is the essence that you establish in life is the one that you think is the right way to live. I mean... It's kind of weird, though, because morality starts to seem as though it's like not objective anymore, according to this view. Uh, if a serial killer believes that like hunting people down and killing as many pos as possible is the good life, then if there's other serial killers out there, they believe that they're doing a fine thing and that their lives are good, too. So there's that problem, right? Maybe you'd like to have a little bit more objectivity in the discussion of what a good human life is. For Sartre, you got to kind of uh, take the good with the bad. Yeah, you're free. And you're totally independent. You could be anything. You're not limited in that way. But also, um, there's no objective facts anymore about how you ought to live. So that makes the decisions kind of tough, right? Normally, when you make choices in life, you make them because you think, I want to make the right choice. But in existentialism, is there any such thing as the right choice? Not really. What the right choice is, is just whatever you, based on your judgment, think is right. So isn't that kind of a weird catch-22? I'm trying to make the right choice, but if I ask myself what it is... I get referred back to my own independent judgment. Let me give an example of that that Sartre talked about here. And I guess we'll close with this uh, for today. When Sartre was alive, it was part of his life spans over World War II, right? And so he was alive during World War II teaching over there in Paris at the university. And he had a student um, that he was instructing who wanted to have an office hour meeting with him. And they talked to Sartre and said, look, Professor, I'm having a very difficult moral dilemma, and I'd like you to help me solve this problem if you can. Give me some advice. Basically, uh, he said this to Sartre. He said, Professor Sartre, okay, my mom is getting really sick, and I want to stick by her side and care for her in her old age because I love my mom, and you know I think that would really be important to her. But if I stay with her, then I can't join the army. And what I also kind of want to do because the Nazis are invading and I want to help defend France is that I want to go on the front lines and fight for our uh, freedom and independence. But I can't do both. You know, if I stay with my mom, I'll help her, but then I might feel guilt that I didn't go and help defend my country. But if I go off and fight in the war, I'll feel good that I helped provide for defense, but I might feel a sense of guilt that I wasn't the loyal son. So what do you think is the right call here, professor? What should I do? Now, he's talking to Professor Jean-Paul Sartre, right, the existentialist. So what do you think Sartre's answer was? What should this young student do? What's the correct action, according to Sartre, for our student? What do you think? It's kind of a trick question and a trick answer, but what do you think is his answer when the student says, what's the right action for me to take? I've got two choices. I can't do both. I have a sense of why each one has some benefit or value. What should I do? Now, according to Sartre, the existentialist, who says that the best life is just whatever you choose, what do you think is his answer there? The action he will take will be the correct action, whichever one he ends up living, right? Yeah, because in order for it to be the right choice, it has to be the choice that he chooses, correct? So and a third party can't really tell him from an external perspective, here's the right choice. It depends on his own values. Now, that's a bit of a catch-22 and a frustrating scenario for our student because he's thinking these thoughts. What kind of person am I? Maybe that'll help me make the choice. Am I more the loyal, devoted son? If that's the case, then I'll stay. Or am I more the like the 
the noble fighter, the warrior. If that's the case, then I should go and fight. But which kind of person he is really cannot be answered until he makes the choice. The choice is what makes it real that he's one of those two types of person. So it's kind of like if you're looking for a fact about your essence to give you a basis for a choice, existentialism is going to pull the rug out from under you because your essence is an ever open-ended ongoing project that your free will is creating. So we really don't know what kind of person he is, the loyal son or the warrior, until he chooses with his free will which thing he's going to do. Putting that choice into action is going to make manifest the fact that he is either the doty son or the valiant warrior. So yeah, in existentialism, we're called on to make choices that are constitutive of our essence, but without any objective fact about what the best essence is, we're thrown back on the resources of our own subjectivity to make these choices for ourselves. In the end, um, <clears throat> Sartre says that some people don't like existentialism because they don't like the way their life turned out and they want to blame someone else for it. And he just says, you've got to take total ownership and responsibility for your essence because you're free, but coming with that freedom is the responsibility to, to take it on the chin and just accept that it's the way you are. So if you like the way that you are, existentialism says, well, pat yourself on the back because you get all the credit because you created that person. If you don't like something about the way you are, though, you shouldn't blame anyone or anything else, and you should simply look in the mirror and recognize that you're the cause of your own being. In the end, he says, the right way to look at existentialism is optimistic toughness. Optimistic toughness. Almost sounds like a paradox, but here's what he's saying, is what he means. The optimistic part is that you can really be anything or anyone you want to be because you do have human free will. That's a different point of view than some of our authors on the metaphysics of time who said that you don't have free will and you're basically locked into a set of actions that's already fully established in the space-time framework. But for Sartre and existentialists, you do have free will. You have radical free will. That's just what it is to even be a human is to have free will. And so according to him, the optimistic part is your freedom and the open-ended nature of your essence that you can control. But the toughness part is that you have to be willing to own those results and not try and blame anyone else for them, like in the case of bad faith. So I'll just read then at the end. He says, um, hmm. When all is said and done, what we are accused of is not pessimism, but optimistic toughness. If people throw up to us works of fiction in which we write about people who are soft, weak, cowardly, sometimes even downright bad, it's not because these people are soft, weak, cowardly, or bad, because if we were to say uh, that they are that way because of heredity, the workings of environment, society, because of biological or psychological determinism, people would be reassured. They would say, well, that's what we're like. No one can do anything about it. But when the existentialist writes about a coward, he says that this coward has chosen to be a coward and is responsible for his cowardice. He's not like that because he has a cowardly heart or lung or brain. He's not like that on account of his physiological makeup, but he's like that because he has made himself a coward by his choices. There's no such thing as a cowardly constitution. Um, as the common people say, or poor blood, but the man whose blood is poor is not a coward on that account. What makes cowardice is the choice to renounce or yield. The constitution is not an act. The coward is defined on the basis of the choices and acts that he performs. This is an interesting quote. Um, people feel in a vague sort of way that the coward we're talking about is guilty of being the coward and the thought frightens them. What people would like is that the coward or the hero was born that way, but that's not true. So, um, that's it in the end, you know, we're free. We're utterly free with our free will and uh, we can shape our essence to be anything we want, but we have to own the responsibility for that. Now, Sartre was an atheist himself, but there's a lot of Christian existentialists. In fact, there's a predecessor of Sartre, the first major existentialist, Kierkegaard, and he's a really radical Christian. Um, his view is that even though God exists, he leaves us alone with our free will to make choices on our own. So even though God is there, he doesn't have a predetermined uh, plan for how your essence will play out. That's still given to you as freedom. Um, Sartre does say that there are some things in your life that you don't have control over, but they don't shape your essence. The word he uses for those things, just quickly, is the word facticity. That's a technical term in Sartre's philosophy. But facticity refers to things about your um, 
being that you could not have chosen. The thing is, though, they're not really deeply revelatory of your essence. So like the time you were born, nobody says, you know, I'm going to be born in the 90s or 80s. It's just you're born. You just happen to be born. That's a choice that's made for you. Uh, the place that you're born, nobody can choose. You know what? Uh, I'd like to be born in the United States um, or some other country. You know, you're just born to whatever parents. The parents that you're born to, um, that's something, of course, you also can't elect. Like, I want those two to be the ones. So there are some things that you can't choose about your life, when you're born, where, or to whom. Uh, but those things, he says, don't ultimately shape the character that is uh, the basis for your essence. So there is some facticity, but it's not uh, essential to your being. And really, I guess that's it, guys. So look, I did not get to cover the last article uh, about death from Thomas Nagel. I was thinking that would be a fun one if we could get to it. Um, he talks about why death is bad. Um, I'm not going to worry about the... Uh, questions on that, I'll just delete them from the study guide for next week, but while we're here, I'll just say why he thinks it's bad. It's bad because it's the end of the goods of life that you're experiencing now. Um, some people think death isn't bad because if death is the end, then you don't experience anything afterwards, so there's no pain or discomfort. But he says just losing the ability to continue having experiences is bad enough, even if there's no subject to experience the loss at the end. Um, because we desire for the continuation of the goods of life to go on, like just having sensations, thought, experience, action. We, we want those things to continue indefinitely long. And so if those are deprived of us at death, if it's really the annihilation of the consciousness, if that's the case, then he says it certainly is a bad thing because it brings to an end all the goods of life that we're experiencing. Um, so I guess in Nagel's mind, we should hope that there is an afterlife because if there's not, then there's a bad end in store uh, where there's no further consciousness. But at the end of the day, I don't know if I actually agree with his view. In my mind, I think that as long as you achieve the goals that you set out for yourself in life um, and you do good, that, um, that that kind of removes the sting of death. It's definitely tragic, I feel, when a person dies prematurely or before they've had the ability to uh, realize their dreams and hopes. So I think that there's a, a, a range of possibilities if death is actually the end. On the other hand, maybe there is the afterlife and dualism is true. And if that's the case, then I guess this is just an illusion in that way. But um, all right, guys, so another good meeting. Uh, I know it's hard to stick with it for a three-hour period, but if any of you, um, you know, watch this later uh, or want to go back to it, it's all there online and, and you guys know how to find it. So any questions from you, uh, anybody here in the room or I keep saying room, any questions from anybody uh in the live stream. If not, I guess I'll let us go. Make sure to look at the study guide. Uh, do your essay that's due next Thursday. Let me know if you need anything in between now and then. I'll be checking my emails every day. Um, but all right, guys, have a great one. Stay safe and uh, appreciate everything uh, that you guys have done all semester. Okay, take care then. Bye-bye.